at what point did you learn that you were supposed to feel ashamed of your body, right? Who taught you that you are required to hate yourself in order to be a moral and worthy person, right? Where did you learn that? I tell my clients all the time, you didn't shoot out of the womb believing this about yourself. The human condition is such that we want to feel a sense of kindness and compassion towards ourselves. And at some point, somebody robbed you of that, right? Somebody stole that from you. And so who was that? Where did you learn that? And what can we do now to provide that tiny person with the compassion and the love and the belonging that they deserved then, but ultimately you're in a position to provide yourself now. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for coming back if you've been here before or hi, welcome if you're new. My name is Mickey, I'm a therapist and we talk about therapy things on this channel and today is a big deal. I'm very excited about this video. We have talked a lot on this channel about fat positivity and how you can be fat and healthy. Um, and I catch a lot of flack for that on the channel, quite honestly, and so I am here. I am queer and today we are talking about uh, fat liberation, body liberation, uh, weight stigma, fat phobia, all of the things. This is going to be, I'm so serious. I know that this is like a meme, but I'm so serious. This is going to be my magnum opus. I am so proud of this video. I have not been this excited about something probably since I wrote my master's thesis. So for real, buckle in, get a snack. This is gonna be a big one, but I'm very excited about it. Like I said, I've caught a lot of flack on this channel for the uh, beliefs that I have for the advocacy that I've done in regards to the fact that you can be fat and healthy and that also being fat is not a thing that should be stigmatized or shamed. I talk about this a lot generally as a clinician because it's something that I have struggled with in my own eating disorder history and also because I've been on the receiving end of an awful lot of medical gaslighting and discrimination and also because I work with folks who are doing eating disorder and body neutrality work. Um, and on top of that, I think it's just the right fucking thing to do. So uh, like I said, today's video is going to be an all encompassing, all in one, one stop shop for all of the answers to these questions. We get a lot of questions um, and requests. Also shout out to our Discord server for real. If there was ever a video that you guys wanna like, uh, like the tip jar thing, um, there's always a link in our description if you want to uh, join our Discord server or our Patreon, cause I'm gonna level with you. I put a lot of work into this video. So if you wanna support me, that's a great way to do it. Um, but we do get a lot of requests and questions about the issue of fat positivity and especially uh, the claims, or not, they're not claims, it's truth. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking that I've done about how anti-fat anti-fatness is just a symptom of anti-blackness. Um, and so we are talking about all of those things today. We are just gonna deep dive into the issue of fatness and answer all of the questions about uh, whether it's true that fat people um, are actually oppressed and that this is related to an issue of racism. Um, can you be fat and healthy? What does weight stigma and diet culture do um, to our brains um, and our bodies? And also like, what does that mean about eating disorder development and all of that stuff? Uh, so that's it, let's get into it. Okay, before we go any further, I wanna talk to you about this week's sponsor, which is Dipsy. I'm so excited to sponsor with Dipsy again because they are such a wonderfully inclusive company and they center the pleasure of people like us, which we're gonna talk later in the video about loving yourself exactly the way that you are. And one of my favorite ways to do that is by making a little Dipsy date with myself. For those of you who don't know, Dipsy is an app that's filled with hundreds of sexy and short audio stories that's perfect to spice up some me time. And my favorite part about it is that the stories are designed by women for women. There is a huge library on Dipsy of immersive soundscapes with stories about everything from vampire hookups all the way to second chance romances. So regardless of what you're into, Dipsy has definitely got you covered. Um, and they also add new content every week and their library includes things like sleep stories and wellness sessions and also sexy written stories. So in between listening to your faves, you can also jump into something new. Dipsy is definitely my go-to place to relax and unwind with myself. And I really think it will be yours too. So for listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30 day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash Mickey. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash Mickey dipsystories.com slash Mickey. Okay, thank you so much to Dipsy for sponsoring this week's video. Let's go ahead and hop back in. Okay, uh, sorry, that was a bit of a catfish. Before we get into it, I do have a bunch of disclaimers for you. I think they're important. I recognize that the people who are committed to misunderstanding me don't need these, these disclaimers and that most of you who are here are loving and kind and wonderful and respectful people, at least at that. However, I have a bunch of disclaimers for you, mostly for my own peace of mind and also so that we can level set before we get into this video. So first and foremost, I wanna be super clear. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a medical professional, and I'm not here to tell anybody what to do about their health or their bodies specifically. I want to be clear that I am a licensed clinician social 
licensed clinical social worker. Um, and while therapists do kind of exist in this gray area where we can um, bill health insurance, for example, for services that health insurance companies deem medically necessary, I am not a medical professional in the sense that I've like gone to med school, right? Like I've never done that. I don't have a doctorate degree. I, least of all, like I don't, I don't major or claim to be an expert in physiology or the body or like um, the medical field in that way, right? So I don't wanna see any comments from anybody talking about how I'm giving people dangerous medical advice or that I'm telling people what to do specifically with their bodies. No, that's not what we're doing here. The purpose of this video is to host a conversation about the greater social and emotional and psychological impact of things like weight stigma and anti-fatness, also anti-blackness, marginalization and discrimination. We're also doing that using evidence-based sources, which by the way, all of those are gonna be linked in the description for you. There's gonna be a Google doc linked in the description with all of my sources because they quite literally probably won't fit in the description because there's so many of them. When I said that I'm like so serious, like I'm being for real, this video has taken me weeks. Um, and there's a lot that went into this video, which is another thing. This video is not just me as a fat person talking about fatness, although I do think that my lived experience is also valuable here personally. This is me as a clinician, as a professional, as a licensed clinical social worker, talking about evidence-based resources, about research, about facts, about history, um, and also about the lived accounts of people who are experts in this field. And so please don't misunderstand. This video is meant to be um, a greater conversation about this, but I am not not going to put up with the uh, like, well, actually comments and the trolling um, in my comment section. Please note, first of all, I think if you're gonna make an ass out of yourself and you're gonna be a troll or you're gonna be hateful or you're gonna be uh, discriminatory in my comment section, I think that you deserve to have an ass made out of yourself publicly. So I won't be deleting anybody's comments unless they need to be removed for the safety of my community. However, I'm not playing with anybody this time. <laughs> if you're gonna leave troll comments, or you're gonna be hateful or discriminatory or a fat phobe or an ass in my comments, then I'm going to be responding to you in kind. And so I don't wanna hear any bitching or moaning about how I hurt your feelings when I responded to you and I came with receipts and talked to you the way that you talked to me. I don't wanna hear it. I'm not available for the complaints and the bitching and the whining this time. If you're gonna be fucking rude, if you're gonna be an asshole, you're gonna be shitty or mean to me or anybody in my community, then we are gonna have that conversation. And I'm gonna respond to you in kind. Again, I'm not playing that game today. I have worked too hard on this video, quite frankly, for my comment section to be overrun by people who are here in bad faith and are uh, simply trying to derail this conversation. Okay, I wanna be clear also before we get going that we are discussing all of this through my lens as a clinical uh, professional like I talked about, because again, as a reminder, if you're new here and you don't know, hi, thanks for coming. I am a licensed clinical social worker. I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in social work from a council on social work education accredited public university. Um, I also possess an independent license that is active, that is current with the Arizona Board of Behavioral Health Examiners to practice clinical social work. And I also have thousands of hours of experience and education and training. Some of that training, by the way, is in topics that are specifically related to what we're talking about today. So especially, again, if you're gonna be one of those people who's in my comments being like, boop, 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 but everybody knows that fatness is bad. No, like we're not doing that. I'm not gonna debate the legitimacy and the realness of empirical and objective data with you, especially after I spent weeks of my free time collecting it, analyzing it to make sure that it's like robust and true and correct and then interpreting that using my thousands of hours of experience, we're not doing that. Like I'm not playing that game. I really just don't have the patience. Like generally speaking, I try to be really kind and also to just like not pay attention to the people who are committed to misunderstanding me or being a troll or being shitty in my comments. But please know this is the hill that I will die on. Like I'm dying on this hill today. And so again, if you're gonna be the person who's in my comments being an ass, I will make an ass out of you. Like rest assured, this is the day where I'm taking the gloves off and I'm not playing games anymore. I wanna be super clear. If you're a kind, normal, uh, respectful person, everybody is welcome to disagree with me, to not like me. I recognize that not everybody's gonna enjoy my delivery or me as a person. That's your prerogative. You're allowed to do that. And I'm also not coming for anybody with my gloves off who's being normal and kind and respectful. If you just have a dissenting opinion, that's fine. But again, I wanna be clear. We're not gonna play the game where like a random person who's like username 65679 whose burrito uh, or profile picture is a burrito is gonna tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. That's not the situation here today. <laughs> Again, I've spent weeks, like this way probably hundreds of hours compiling all this information. I've literally spent my own professional hard earned money on trainings on this subject matter. And so again, this video is like, it's important to me. It's uh, it's also all like evidence-based and empirical data. And I'm just not interested in playing the game of like, boop, 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 but like, no, we're not. 
or not, because I know I'm right, and also I don't need to, to pretend to be nice to people who are committed to misunderstanding me. On top of that, um, this is for the rest of you who are normal, nice, respectful people. Um, this video might bring up some big feelings for people. We're not just having a conversation about fatness or body positivity today. We're having a greater conversation about the impact of marginalization and discrimination and racism and oppression. And all of those topics are like big and heavy and scary. And especially when we as people with privilege um, have to acknowledge that privilege and like be willing to sort of like let go of that and like have that called out onto the carpet, that's uncomfy, right? And I really wanna humanize that. I wanna give people space to be human around that. And also I'm asking kindly and politely at the outset that if you do have big feelings about some of the stuff that I'm gonna talk today, that we practice looking inward before we lash out in my comment section. I recognize again, as a person with privilege, it's not a thing that I particularly enjoy acknowledging the ways that I've benefited from uh, systems of oppression that uh, discriminate against and marginalize and kill people, right? That's difficult and uncomfortable. And again, the conversation about liberation in any context really um, is one where when we uh, advocate for the most marginalized among us that we are all being advocated for, right? And so having an inclusive focus in this conversation is very, very important to me. Again, this is something that like a part of our larger advocacy work calls us to do. And so I'm asking you again, politely, kindly at the outset to get on board, to like be part of that and just look inward, just reflect on whatever big feelings you're having. Again, you're welcome to have them and to feel them, to voice them even, honestly. <laughs> um, but again, I'm just asking that you guys look inward before we like finger point. That's all. So all of that said, it's time for us to talk about our subject material today. We're gonna talk a lot about health in this video because there is a lot of yelling on that people do about how fat people must be inherently unhealthy and so therefore they're inherently bad. And so I think that's a perfect place for us to start the conversation. So let's talk about health and healthism and health discrimination and all of those things. First and foremost, we need to be clear about the fact that health is not a moral flex, right? Being unhealthy is not immoral, nor does it make anybody deserving of discrimination or um, cruelty or lack of care. I think it's really important to point out that acting like when someone is unhealthy means that they don't deserve a basic kindness or human respect is really fucking shitty, first of all, but it's also ableist as fuck, right? Like this belief that fat people deserve to be made fun of or disrespected or um, marginalized or oppressed because they're unhealthy and so therefore they're unworthy comes from an ableist belief. This is why I said like, two seconds ago, that it's important for this conversation to be inclusive and for us to have a focus on like uplifting uh, marginalized folks generally. This is not just a conversation about fatness. As I was doing the research for this video, I was like, we'll try to keep it succinct. Then I was like, we can't, we can't, like I literally just cannot, you can't host this conversation honestly and like truthfully without being real about the fact this is not just about body size, this is about marginalization and oppression and systems of power. And so when we talk about health in this video, I do also want to be clear that we're going to talk a lot about how it is possible to be a fat person or a person of varying sizes and also be healthy. But we're not talking about that because you need to be healthy in order to be worthy of respect and care and accommodation. We're talking about it because it's wrong, like because the belief that fat people can't be healthy is wrong. But I do want to be clear from the jump that being unhealthy, being disabled is morally neutral. And also I don't give a fuck like how somebody ended up disabled. This is a lot of the discourse also about like fat people deserve it because they knew first of all, fuck that, that sucks. But second of all, people become disabled in a variety of ways. And so again, stigmatizing people and saying you're not worthy of care because you somehow participated in the circumstances that ended up you in you being disabled sucks, right? Like this idea, this concept of the worthy poor dates all the way back to Elizabethan England. It sucks. Um, it's also been a tool of capitalism to oppress people and to like prioritize corporate bottom lines and, and profit margins, right? And like, we're not bringing that fucking energy here. That sucks. And that's just like not what we're about in my community. Also for what it's worth, straight up, like unless you're the guy who makes the decisions about how our social supports budgets are being spent, like quite frankly, it's above your pay grade, babe. So just like fucking sit down. Like I don't need any of your fucking feedback about it. You're not the guy. So like, stop talking about it. The other thing that's important to acknowledge here is that the truth is that whether you agree or disagree or, or have empathy for disabled people, the truth is that we will either die young or uh, become disabled at some point in our lives. If you can't bother to have the basic fucking human empathy for disabled people because they're fucking people that deserve empathy and compassion, you might at least wanna relearn that value for yourself because one day you'll probably fucking need it. Okay, all of that aside, um, I wanna talk about this debate of like, is it possible to be fat and healthy at the same time? Because there's a lot of discourse about how 
how fatness is being stigmatized and mocked and treated with a lot of cruelty and disrespect. Not because we hate fat people. It's not that. It's just that you're unhealthy and we really care about you. We don't want you to be unhealthy. So we're gonna shame you and judge you and be really fucking mean to you about it. That's why we're doing it. So let's talk about what the research actually says um, in regards to this question of can you be fat and healthy at the same time? This is going really well. Who am I? Okay, so spoiler, <laughs> the research seems to indicate that yes, in fact, you can uh, be fat and healthy. However, uh, before I info dump on you about all of the uh, fat and healthy stuff, we should talk about what health even is because the uh, conversation about health centers around a lot of things, um, particularly the BMI, don't you worry, we're gonna talk about the fucking BMI in a hot second, but it centers around a lot of things that ultimately end up being not actually really very valuable pieces of data in regards to like what somebody's health actually is. The determinants of health, there is a really helpful diagram. I'm gonna put it up on the screen for you. There's a really helpful diagram about the social determinants of health that I think is very illuminating. I use this in my work a lot when we talk about eating disorder recovery, especially. Oftentimes we've internalized this belief that like, well, I wanna be healthy. And so yes, I maybe have a little bit of an eating disorder, but like if it's because I'm fat and I wanna be thin, then like that's guided by a desire to be healthy, right? And so like, this is totally fine. Don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not mocking anybody. This is a thing that I did too. I believe that it's a difficult, or did believe that, I mean, it was a difficult place to get out of. Your brain becomes kind of warped in this like eating disorder place. Um, and so this is very morally neutral and okay. And also it's important for us to acknowledge, again, this question of like, what is health actually? This diagram, again, all of the sources are linked in the description if you wanna go look at it, but I'm gonna put this up on the screen for you now. This diagram is called the social determinants of health. And it has many, many, many data points on it about what actually makes up this larger picture of a person's health, because again, spoilers, it's very complex. Um, so this is the section of the diagram that specifically mentions your height and weight. Um, waist and hip ratio is also on there. And then this is the section that also uh, features these determinants um, about your diet patterns and your physical activity. Now that we've looked at those, <laughs> this is the whole diagram. Again, like I said, this question of like what actually makes up our health is filled with a vast, many, many data points, right? The diagram is broken down into five main categories. Uh, genetics and biology, social circumstances, individual behavior, physical environment, and medical care. Each of those five categories is then broken down into separate sections called macro determinants, meaning large, macro meaning large, um, and micro determinants, micro meaning small, right? All of those are then broken down even further into measurements or metrics that we can use to measure the micro and macro determinants. The reason that I showed you the diagram in the way that I did is because body weight is listed as one of the four metrics um, that we use to measure the macro determinant body structure. The other three macro determinants in this category are your height, your waist to hip ratio, and your age. Diet patterns and physical activity are also listed as macro determinants for the individual behavior category. And those are measured using your uh, exercise vital signs and something called MET minutes. It's a very complicated formula complicated formula to assess basically how much energy somebody is burning when they're exercising, doesn't matter. The reason that I'm pointing this out to you in this way is because when we look at this entire diagram, it's filled with all of these different pieces of information and, and pieces of data about our health. And only a very, very small percentage of those have to do with our body size or shape or our weight. Some of the other things on this diagram include things like your sleep pattern, your sexual orientation, your blood pressure, your exposure to firearms, the quality of your health insurance, the walkability of the city that you live in, your motor vehicle behavior, drug use, discrimination, life satisfaction, bone density, religious involvement, your hopelessness, depression, and anxiety levels all listed separately, your social connection, Connectedness, your income, your education level, your fitness, and your immunizations. <laughs> I'd also like to point out that a lot of the things that I just listed and the things on the diagram generally are not things that you can perceive from the outside, right? You can't tell what somebody's immunization status is necessarily <laughs> just by looking at them. But we as a society don't really have conversations about these things, right? Like we do have conversations about drug and alcohol use and motor vehicle activity and firearm. Well, we shouldn't be having conversations about firearm use, but we don't necessarily have a lot of conversations about these other, especially the biological determinants of health, the um, genetic and individual behavior ones. We're not necessarily having conversations and no one has ever said, you look like you have low bone density and I'm gonna be fucking mean to you because you're a low bone density ass looking bitch. Like nobody says that. And this is for a good reason. This is why it's important for us to kind of interrogate this line of thinking that like, it is okay to discriminate against fat people because they're unhealthy. And so therefore I'm participating in their health because we don't do this in regards to any of the other determinants of health. And like, why? Why is that? That's the question that we should be asking in regards to 
this conversation. What we do know from the research is that first of all, your socioeconomic status is one of the most uh, reliable predictors about whether or not you're going to be a healthy person. This is for a very good reason because for example, if you don't have money, you can't necessarily easily access high quality health insurance, which means then you're gonna have a harder time accessing good quality medical care, which will mean then that you're more likely to have what is actually a, at the moment, small issue turn into a larger and more chronic issue. And it also is uh, relevant in regards to the food and time uh, parts of our life, right? If you live in a food desert where you don't have access to a grocery store that has affordable and accessible food that allows you to cook meals at home, that provides you with a better, uh, like more nutritionally dense uh, meal plan generally, that's going to impact your overall nutrition. And especially when we talk about time, right? If you are a person who has to work several jobs to keep food on the table and the lights on and a roof over your family's head, you don't have the time to rest or to spend time with your community or to necessarily be as religiously or socially involved as you would want to, to be exercising as much as you would want to, to cook home cooked meals, um, to be doing all of these things that are listed on this diagram that we know are positive, uh, like health promoting behaviors, the socioeconomic status that you have, if you end up on the lower end of this spectrum, it's going to be a barrier in almost all areas of your health. And so this is why having a conversation about equity in regards to socioeconomic status and capitalism and racism and discrimination is really, really key when we talk about people's health actually. But again, we're not having that conversation. People talk about fatness instead and like to, to label and stigmatize that and reduce people to their body size. For what it's worth, also your cardiorespiratory fitness and your frequency of physical exercise are also more reliable indicators of your overall health, generally speaking. Exercising is like one of the most important uh, health promoting behaviors that we have or that we know about from the research. And so this again is part of the conversation that we wanna be encouraging people to participate in health promoting behaviors um, in a way that's not stigmatizing and not judgment. We're gonna get there though We'll talk about that in a minute. Before we talk about uh, exercise and health promoting behaviors and all of that stuff, I think we need to start from the beginning and we need to talk about the BMI. It's time. So the BMI or the body mass index was invented by a Belgian statistician, mathematician, and astronomer, Adolf Quetelet. He was most famous for his apparent fixation uh, with what he called the average man, not in the sense of mediocre, which that's a whole mouthful to be clear, but not in the sense of being mediocre, in the sense of like plotting things on a bell curve. At the time that uh, Quetelet was doing a lot of research, the fascination with putting things on a bell curve was like sort of at an all time high. Um, and so a lot of the research that he did was about trying to to identify who the average man was in terms of body size um, by using this formula that ultimately spoiler, uh, would become the BMI. So the BMI is essentially an equation where you take uh, your height and you divide it by, or no, your weight and you divide it by your height squared. Doesn't matter, it's stupid anyways. Like I mentioned, at the time there was a lot of fixation with plotting things on a bell curve. And so what would eventually become the BMI was essentially an academic exercise is how it's described um, in the research where um, Kechele was trying to determine what the average body size would be of the like average average man because he considered that to be the ideal. Um, and so he conducted a lot of research, uh, mostly with white Western European men. This section is gonna be a little bit more um, like research heavy because it's history and I don't wanna get it wrong. So I'm gonna read you a couple of quotes. The first of which being um, his pioneering cross-sectional studies of human growth led him to conclude that other than the spurts of growth after birth and during puberty, the weight increases as the square of the height. Again, this was meant to be an analysis of populations in a larger, broader picture. It was essentially an academic exercise intended to ascertain what we can conclude about human growth rates on the large scale when we talk about the human population generally. I do also want to point out though that even though this was like an academic exercise to determine like the large scale population growth patterns and all this stuff, this was about white Western European men, right? Especially the initial sample size included no people of color. This was purely white Western European men, Zoomy time. Even then didn't really provide us with a lot of useful and meaningful data about uh, human growth patterns generally because it was such a limited and obviously biased sample. There's also a lot of flaws with this because first of all, Kajalai never intended this to be a metric of individual health. He wasn't a doctor or a physiologist. Um, he also didn't have any interest in studying obesity or body weight in that sense. Um, and it also um, had nothing to do with individual determinants of health. So from the outset, this was like a very limited and like not necessarily very informative experiment, except that somehow 
we'll get there. Um, it <laughs> ended up being listed or used as like the metric for all of our health, um, even now in the year 2024. At this point, we also have to talk about the fact that his work would also be used as foundational material for several pseudosciences and really problematic. I was going to call them sciences, but they're not, they're pseudosciences. The first of which being eugenics. Uh, <laughs> Cantile ended up being uh, the guy who paved the way for the use of eugenics later. I don't think that he did this on purpose to be clear, but still this sucks. Um, and also um, another pseudoscience that would assert that people of color were um, an inferior species, meaning that they were not even part of the human species, they were separate um, and labeled people of color, particularly black people um, as savages and people who were congenital congenitally driven to commit crime. So that's a fucking side eye. Again, I just really wanna point out the fact that this thing that's being used as the metric for all of our health in the year 2024, again, not only was this deeply flawed as an experiment from the beginning, but it was also inherently racist and it paved the way for a lot of really harmful and also wrong uh, pseudoscientific beliefs. Unfortunately, um, KHLA was uh, not the first, nor was he the last person to contribute to weight-based racial prejudice. Um, Sabrina Strings outlines this so succinctly and, and effectively in her book, Fearing the Black Body, highly recommend, by the way, Way. It's a really useful and interesting read. I'm not going to summarize the entire book for you because it took me like six and a half hours to listen to, but there are key points, a few key points that I want to talk about with you. I think they're really important. First and foremost, Strings refutes the idea that we as a culture hate fatness because it has anything to do with health, um, especially because uh, fatness and voluptuousness quote unquote, uh, voluptuousness was originally associated with fat bodies. As the slave trade expanded and white Western European people became exposed to African people as they were enslaving them, this cultural belief started to develop about the voluptuousness of black bodies being associated with overindulgence, with savagery, um, with a lack of self-restraint. And especially there's a lot of weird, also puritanical religious vibes that were happening at the time because of the way that America was founded. And so a lot of that cultural value weaved itself into this also. Um, and so again, I just want to point out that Sabrina Strings outlines this really clearly in her book that as white people became more exposed to, well, black and brown people that they enslaved, our cultural values about fatness began to evolve in this like perfectly parallel way in the sense that the, the more that the slave trade expanded, the more that our cultural values about fatness became stigmatized and laced with uh, judgment and hatred because of white supremacy. And so this is also why it's really important to have this discourse and like make the unspoken part of this spoken because because the assertion that we as a, a society and a culture hate fatness because it's unhealthy has been a lie from the outset, right? There was never a part of this stigmatizing of fat and large and voluptuous bodies that had anything to do with their health, but rather it was about labeling enslaved people as being inherently inferior, being savages, being um, of poor moral repute, uh, and being people who were inherently um, unreliable at moderating themselves. And so that's why they were fat, because they were inferior, because they were bad or less than, um, and there was no care or concern about these people's health. The social rhetoric about fatness and healthiness and whether or not this was a healthy or moral behavior happened later. We can see again that this evolution took place in a perfectly parallel way that as the slave trade expanded, our society became more judgmental and stigmatizing of fatness. But the discourse about like, is fatness healthy really didn't become a thing until we had already culturally established that we as a society hate fat people because it is a trait that is inherently linked with black people. This is why when we have the conversation about anti-fatness and fat phobia and weight stigma, we have to have an intersectional and inclusive conversation because the truth is that anti-fatness is merely a symptom of anti-blackness. But as soon as our society started to associate fatness, voluptuousness, curviness with black bodies, that is when the change took place about our society stigmatizing and judging and being disgusted with uh, fat bodies. Okay, um, I know it took a little bit of, uh, you know, Detour, thank you. I know we took a little bit of a detour, um, but I do wanna talk about KHLA's index because unfortunately for all of us, um, it didn't die with him. Um, and so we need to talk about the simplistic formula uh, that he created and how it ended up being um, the metric for all of our health. A lot of it had to do with capitalism because of course it did. So in the 1940s, insurance companies started to analyze the body sizes and body weights of their customers in trying to ascertain trends in regards to who dies first, basically, so that they could charge people appropriately and try to make more money um, in this like, 
health insurance conglomerate. You get it. So the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company created these tables. They're so offensive, by the way. <laughs> like in researching this, I was like, this isn't real, right? Like it's not true. It is, it's true. The Metropolitan uh, Life Insurance Company created these tables that categorize people into different sections based on their body size. So it basically assigned a correct weight based on your frame. Um, you could be a small frame, a medium frame, or a large frame. You had about five pounds of wiggle room and all of that was based on your height. So there was just this table basically that you would say, I am a small frame man who's five foot nine. Um, and then you would look at what your body weight was supposed to be. The problem is that these are completely arbitrary, right? First of all, there was no science or research to back why this was the correct weight. Literally just made it up. But on top of that, the small, medium, or large frame, purely subjective. Literally just all up for debate. There was no objective data about how to categorize people into these charts. So um, while this was being used as the metric, because apparently Ketele's index was lost to science at this time, whatever. But apparently these uh, tables that were made by the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, who by the way, nowadays is known as MetLife, that insurance company uh, used those tables as a metric for our health until the 1990s. I just want to remind you, I just want to really put it out there again, um, that we made it up. The, the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company literally said <laughs> with a crayon on a piece of lined paper, basically, and that was being used as the metric for all of our health until the 1990s which I love. I think if that doesn't really poke a hole in this idea that like fatness and body size are an inherent indicator of health, I don't fucking know what does. Um, however, at this point, we have to talk about Ansel Keys because Ansel Keys did a lot of research with a bunch of other, his researcher friends um, in the 70s because Ansel Keys took issue with the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company's tables. He felt that they were not a good evaluator of body size or fatness which is true. Unfortunately, Ansel Keys wasn't really much closer to the fucking answer though, because he was the guy who said, let's do the study where we're gonna use three different methods. One of which is like underwater weight displacement, like volume displacement. Um, one of which is skin calipers and the other one is Ketele's index. These three means were all pitted against each other in a shitty science fair to see which one was the most superior at identifying people's levels of obesity. And unfortunately for us all, Ketele's index was identified as the most successful at predict correctly predicting uh, people's obesity. And this is my favorite. This is my favorite part. Everybody shout it out. It's like Dora the Explorer. Everybody shout it out right now. What do you think the success rate was for Ketele's index when they conducted this experiment? It was 50%, it was 50%. They decided that Ketele's index was the winner of this experiment and should be used and integrated into the modern medical community because it could correctly predict obesity 50% of the time. Love that for us. So let's be clear about what predicting obesity actually means. The goal here was to accurately determine how much fat was actually on somebody's body. There's a lot of fixation that white men seem to have with figuring out how much fat is on people's bodies, which I think is a great segue for us to talk about all of the fucking problems that exist with the BMI generally, I mean, besides the things we've already talked about. Oh, also this is worth noting um, that again, even when Ansel Keys redid the whole thing, um, the index was only successful at uh, doing this with white men. Even in the fucking study that Ansel Keys and all of his buddies did, they actually wrote up in the fucking study, in, in the, the outcomes of this clinical study that they conducted, that they did include South African uh, black men on purpose for the, the goal of trying to be uh, like a better evaluator of, you know, like this uh, phenomenon across different racial lines. And because it didn't work with black men, they just said, oh, and just scooched it out. And they said, mm, don't worry about it. We, mm, ooh, oops, sorry. It does work with the white men, unfortunately. It doesn't work with the South African men. Don't worry about it. Anyways, just, just charge it on forward. Um, so again, I just want to point out that even when we redid this and we did try uh, supposedly as a scientific community to reevaluate this tool um, from a more inclusive lens that it still shit the bed and we used it anyways. Honestly, yeah, this is a really good uh, opportunity for us to pause and talk about the fact that this 50% uh, efficacy rate was enough somehow for us to be like, no, it's fine. Let's just incorporate it into modern medical practice. Can you imagine if your surgeon was like, there's a 50% shot that I'll cut the right part of you off. <laughs> you ready? Like sign your paperwork. This medication has a 50% shot at actually treating the problem that you have. Maybe it'll give you diarrhea. Maybe it'll kill you. Maybe it'll solve your problem. 
what can you do? Like there is no world in a modern medical situation where a 50% efficacy rate is enough for us to be prescribing this to the whole of humanity also. Like I want to point that out, not even in like a very specific and and niche like subgenre of people was this like, well, maybe we can use it with these people. No, like this was being outlined as the way to identify obesity in all people always for the rest of time, even though by their own evaluation, a 50% success rate was the best that we could produce after we excluded people that it didn't work for even after we cooked the books, the best that we could get was a 50% success rate. Like that's mind blowing to me that we as a society just like, this is fine, it's all fine, let's just keep using this, like that's nuts. Okay, so at this point, obviously the BMI became a cornerstone um, in modern medical care and it was integrated more fully into our medical practice, but because the flaws and the holes with the BMI are never ending, we're gonna talk about some other areas that it shits the bed. The BMI, for those of you who don't know, um, even after this uh, really embarrassing study that was conducted with Ansel Keys, it was integrated into our modern medical care um, and then used as the metric, but in the 1990s, the obesity task force uh, I think is what it's called. Hold on. There was a task force? Yeah, the International Obesity Task Force um, was doing a lot of chatting about how they really disliked obesity. Basically what happened in 1998 is that the International Obesity Task Force said, we don't like it. So the BMI categories got changed. Previously, uh, 18 and under would be considered underweight. 18 to 27.8 would be normal weight. 27.8 and beyond is the categories for overweight, obese, and severely obese. They decided in 1998 that we should lower the threshold for being overweight from 27.8 to 25. It's over three points lower um, just because. The, I also want to point out in the scientific and medical research, there's literally no justification for why we picked the number 25. A lot of the suspicion that we have now is that it was just a vanity number. Truly because one of the articles that I looked at that I will link in the description said, people like when numbers are ending in a five or a zero and so 25 just made more sense. Like I'm, I'm not shitting you, I mean so fucking astronomically not, for real. It's not the volume on a TV. <laughs> yeah, so besides the fact that it was arbitrarily lowered to a vanity number for no good goddamn reason other than the International Obesity Task Force said that it should, we should also talk about the fact that the rationale at the time was that the obesity epidemic um, was out of control and so lowering the thresholds would mean that more people were receiving treatment, except that what they didn't tell you is that the International Obesity Task Force was making millions of dollars from two main pharmaceutical companies who were heavily advertising weight loss drugs. Also, the chairman of the NIH, the National Institutes in Health Committee, uh, was the guy who made the decision and he was consulting with several diet drug manufacturers and Weight Watchers International at the time. So this is again, uh, this is an important moment for us to pause and to talk about the role that capitalism plays in our healthcare because we can't escape it. This is one of these moments that when people say the BMI is useless, using the BMI as a determinant of health is a waste of time. This is why. Like again, first of all, it was flawed from the outset like we talked about. We pro proved with further research later that it continued to be useless unless it was being applied in very specific and niche circumstances with only white Western European men, but also that when we decided in 1990 to lower it, we made it even further useless because it's literally just made up mumbo jumbo now. It's literally just random numbers that has nothing to do with anything based in science or evidence or research. And literally we just invented another reason for essentially um, weight loss drug manufacturers to sell more prescriptions, to make more money and to prescribe uh, weight loss to people as a means for making money. I know that I have talked a lot about how much the BMI sucks, but don't worry, it gets worse. There are still more problems with the BMI. Um, like we talked about, the BMI has not been meaningfully updated uh, to be inclusive in regards to race or ethnicity. Um, and while there have been a few changes made um, in regards to Asian uh, people specifically, mostly to address the fact that Asian people are uh, congenitally more prone to diagnoses of heart disease, I believe it is. Yeah, cardiovascular disease at lower BMI, so their thresholds were adjusted, but there's been no meaningful adjustment otherwise in regards to race, ethnicity, or gender. So now, currently, in the year 2024, <laughs> the BMI is continuing to use the same metrics and standards that it did in 1970 fucking eight, ex with the exception of making the threshold lower in 1998, where we proved that its efficacy um, at predicting obesity was at best 
best a crapshoot. So this is again, one of the things that's really important for us to acknowledge. Uh, when we talk about this conversation of like fatness is inherently unhealthy. We know that being fat is bad. Look at your BMI. The, the very metric that we're using to determine whether people are fat or not isn't real and it isn't true and it isn't helpful. My favorite example of this um, is that uh, the BMI, because it is so unreliable at accurately predicting obesity, obesity. Um, to be clear, obese is a pejorative term. It sucks, but we're using it because that's what the medical community uses. And just for the sake of succinctness, that's why we're using that term. But like generally as a person and also as a fat, don't like it. Um, everybody's welcome to have their own terms that they use to describe themselves. But obesity sucks. Really try to shy away from using that word if you can. However, my favorite example of why the BMI sucks, um, again, because the BMI um, is intended to predict obesity, right? It's pretended, pretended, the BMI is intended uh, to predict obesity. Its purpose is to try try to illuminate how much adipose tissue is on someone's body. Except that because the BMI is a very simplistic formula that was tested on only white European uh, men, it doesn't differentiate between adipose tissue and muscle tissue. So it's very common for folks either in uh, particularly, who are particularly tall, particularly short, and particularly muscular for their BMIs to be uninformative. My favorite, favorite, favorite example of this is that Stone Cold Steve Austin, uh, based just on his BMI, is technically considered to be obese, except that he's not actually fucking obese because the man is a wrestler and obviously is very muscular and a lot of his weight, his relationship to gravity is informed by the fact that his tissue that's on his body is particularly dense, which makes you weigh more. This is another aspect of the BMI that really fucking irritates the shit out of me is that ultimately all it does is evaluate our body's relationship with gravity in our current environment. And that's a fundamentally useless metric of our health anyways. That's neither here nor there. I also wanna talk about what the BMI means in regards to our health outcomes. Uh, the thing that I really wanna stress upon you at this point after having addressed why the BMI <laughs> sucks so much is that it leads to an over-involvement in diagnosis in fat people and it leads to an under-involvement and under-diagnosis in not fat people. So what I mean when I say that it leads to an over-involvement and over-diagnosis in fat people is that oftentimes because of weight stigma, uh, which is a stigma that we assign based on somebody's outward appearance, um, fat people are often subjected to poking and prodding, literally and figuratively, um, when they receive routine medical care because doctors assume that if your BMI, BMI is high, then therefore you must be unhealthy. The problem with this is that first of all, it's somewhat common for these people to be diagnosed and put on things like a pre pre diabetes watch list. I'm not even joking. That's a real thing that's happened to people. Um, but also for people to be prescribed weight loss drugs, for people to be prescribed, be prescribed interventions and medications, pharmaceuticals, things that are not actually healthy or safe for them purely because of their body size. This also happens in the reverse where uh, normal weight people will have their chronic medical conditions um, go undiscovered or um, not noticed because doctors just assume that if you're thin, then therefore you're healthy. And so we don't need to look into these other concerns. So generally like all around the board, I do wanna be clear, this is a conversation where we need to uplift and honor that fat people by and large bear a lot of the discrimination and stigma um, socially for being fat, but also this like negatively uh, affects everybody right? Like thin people, especially chronically ill thin people oftentimes have their concerns written off. This does happen to fat people also to be clear, but they'll have their concerns written off because they're thin. And so therefore no further investigation is warranted. Again, I want to acknowledge that this happens in the reverse. This has happened to me, um, that if you're fat doctors will prescribe you weight loss and weight loss only, and they will refuse to acknowledge or investigate your medical concerns until you have complied with their treatment plan of weight loss, which we're going to talk later about how prescribing weight loss is fucking barbaric. But I want to draw your attention to a study before we close out this section about the BMI um, because the findings were particularly interesting to me. One study that I looked at found that 30% of the normal weight participants actually had metabolic abnormalities that went undiscovered, uh, whereas 29% of the overweight participants uh, were metabolically healthy and yet again were being poked and prodded um, and being told that they were inherently unhealthy people even though we can see that that's not true. Oh, 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 uh, one other quote that I want to read you also from a source that again I will link in the description talked about, uh, I think this is from the CDC website actually, um, talked about like, what are we supposed to do with the BMI then? So this says, what should we conclude about the BMI? Because the BMI does not measure body fat directly, it should not be used as a diagnostic tool. Instead, BMI should be used as a measure to track weight status in populations, which was its original fucking purpose. It was meant to be a descriptive analytic of large populations over long periods of time that would inform us about human growth patterns and never, never was it intended to be used as an individual metric of health 
again, for all of the reasons that I've already listed because it shits the bed at doing that. Okay, hi, hello, it is actually a different day. That is why I'm wearing a different outfit. Um, I got tired, so we took a break and we are back to talk about some more stuff. Now that we have evaluated that the BMI fucking blows and also that people's health is made up of a whole bunch of other things uh, and in fact, not just their weight, I wanna talk to you about health at every size. Okay, health at every size is commonly abbreviated as H-A-E-S, some people call it Haze. Basically, the health at every size book was the foundational material for a lot of people in the body positive, fat liberation, fat neutral movement um, to make this assertion that fatness and healthiness are not necessarily mutually exclusive. This is an important moment for us to pause and acknowledge that Lindo Bacon, who is the author of Health at Every Size, uh, did actually turn out to be a shitty fucking person. However, um, I think we can acknowledge the value of the work here without necessarily uplifting Lindo Bacon uh, specifically, especially because it's important for us to talk about the body of research um, that supports this assertion that it's possible to be fat and healthy because there's a large body of research to support that this is factual. To start with, we know for certain that there is actually no relationship between weight loss and healthiness, least of all a positive one. Uh, to be clear, when I talk about positive or negative relationships in this video, I also want to uh, clarify that um, I'm not using that in the sense of like good or bad, but what I mean is like in terms of research positive, meaning if one uh, factor increases, then the other one also increases. We know from the research is that if we look at these two pieces of data, um, weight loss increasing or like the amount of weight lost um, does not correlate with an improvement in your health. However, a uh, quick caveat <laughs> to point out here that there is lots of research that will make this assertion um, that weight loss does correlate with an increase in your healthiness overall. But this is one of those moments where it's really important for us to pause and talk about. I know that it's a, a little boring, but hear me out, it's important for us to talk about actually evaluating and interrogating research to make sure that it's um, factual and actually like efficient because this assertion that losing weight uh, improves your healthiness is often always done um, in studies that are very short term. And so they evaluate people's objective healthiness, usually less than a year is the, the follow-up data that we get. And I really wanna point out and like encourage everybody to be aware of the fact that when we look at these studies, first of all, the means through which a lot of people achieve this type of weight loss is by incorporating a large amount of exercise into their lives. And as we've already fucking talked about, exercise, specifically cardiometabolically intense exercise, is one of the most effective vehicles to improve improve and benefit your health, right? This is the health promoting behavior that doctors want you to walk away from uh, their appointments with you taking away. That's what I want you to walk away from this video um, understanding. And so when we look at these very short term research um, analyses of people's health, compared with their weight loss, the assertion is commonly made that, oh my gosh, weight loss makes you so much healthier. And that's not necessarily true because first of all, there's very little follow-up with these people past five years, if even that. And what we know, well, we're gonna talk about the statistics on permanent weight loss later, but what we know when we look at longer follow-ups is that there is not actually a relationship between weight loss and your improvement in your health, especially when we talk about long-term, again, evaluating um, your overall picture of health rather than just these one or two small pieces of data. Also, it has been demonstrated in the research that folks in the overweight BMI category have uh, the lowest mortality rates for acute coronary syndrome, while those in the normal BMI uh, category actually have the highest mortality rates. This is a phenomenon that holds true for a lot of very serious illnesses. For example, kidney failure, stroke, other heart-related illnesses like heart attacks and heart disease. Um, and it's also true in regards to general life expectancy. When we exclude extremes on either side of the BMI spectrum, this holds true. The research proves that overweight people in the overweight um, and obese BMI categories uh, will live at least as long, if not longer actually, than their normal uh, BMI weight counterparts. Um, and to be clear, this is not me finding one fringe study that I like cherry picked to make my point in this video. This is from a meta-analysis that analyzed, quote, over 350 subjects from 26 studies and found overweight to be associated with a greater longevity than normal weight. So I'm not making this stuff up. I'm not cherry picking research to prove my point. This is something that is well well supported in the research and in the data as being true and factual, again, especially when we look at the results for this long term. It has also been proven, by the way, that folks in larger bodies, um, when safety features are being used correctly, are more likely to survive serious car accidents or other impact-based injury because their adipose tissue will protect all of their vital organs and their bone structure um, in the event of an impact. I do wanna make a quick caveat here to be clear though, um, that seat belts and car safety features generally are not made with fat people in mind, and so it's very important that we be using 
fastening the safety features correctly. For example, uh, in a car where you have the belt that goes across your chest and then across your lap, you wanna make sure that the lap band is tucked underneath your belly um, and is sitting on or at least as close to your hip bones as you can possibly get it because the research about surviving a car accident based on this seat belt structure informs us that your uh, pubic, pelvic bone, <laughs> pubic bone, your pelvic bone, um, is one of the sturdiest bones in your body. And that is the bone that ideally we want to absorb the impact from um, a high speed car accident, for example. But if you have that lap band sitting across your belly, it will rip through the soft tissue in your belly and then uh, rip open all of your internal organs. It's very dangerous. It's very fatal. That sucks. It's also another way that fat people are being discriminated against um, and not taken into account. But when people are using those safety features correctly, it is true that they are more likely to survive a, a car accident or other like impact-based injuries. Generally, fat people tend to be relatively resilient in regards to like recovering from injuries. Again, we can see this demonstrated in long-term longitudinal like, like meta-analysis kind of stuff. This is like not one fringe study to be clear. So that's also important to be aware of. Oh, also fatness has been associated, uh, or at least in the research, it's been found to be associated with higher levels of muscle mass in the body. Um, and so this also tends to correlate with fat people actually being better at strength-based exercises, particularly uh, weightlifting exercises. Um, and this is another way that people can incorporate exercise into their, their life also. Um, and so all of this kind of adds up to this picture, right? That like we as a culture have accepted this idea that fatness means that you are inherently unhealthy, that you are less than, that you are less capable, that you are more likely to die except actually we have a whole bunch of fucking research to prove that that's not true. And so the medical community refers to this phenomenon as the obesity paradox. This is an important thing for us to discuss in regards to the research about fatness and healthiness, because this is kind of my favorite thing. I won't even lie to you. Um, the medical community is so befuddled and vexed by this phenomenon that they just continue to pour money into these research studies to try to disprove this phenomenon, except that they just keep reproving that it's true. And so we have actually a large body of research to support how true and uh, replicable this phenomenon is in research. Let's talk about some other stuff in regards to that. Hold on. I'm not going to lie. I wouldn't normally promote substances, but for this, I think it's... I used to call caffeine a performance enhancing drug and he was right. Can you feel your performance being enhanced? Ah, okay. S <laughs> so like I said, the obesity paradox essentially refers to this phenomenon in the research where we can prove definitively that fatness at the very least does not correlate with poor outcomes in health necessarily, um, and actually is associated with positive outcomes in regards to health, but the medical community is real committed to their bit of hating fat people. And so we keep pouring money and effort into this research only to continue to prove the phenomenon to be true. But I wanna talk about one thing that's not in the research, uh, which is the evidence of a relationship between fatness and uh, disease or mortality. Even though we have this assertion that fat people will die sooner, that they're going to have a heart attack. I've had people leave these things in my comments before that like, ha ha ha, you're not gonna be laughing when you have a heart attack. People really are committed to this idea that fatness is inherently related to disease and mortality but we don't have proof of a causal link between those two. We do have proof of correlation between those two in some research, but again, this is another important moment for us to interrogate and analyze research because uh, for those of you who are like familiar with uh, research or like fallacies even, um, you'll be familiar with this idea that a correlation does not equal a causation. This is really important for us to talk about, especially in regards to medical and health related research because a correlation between two things does not justify intervention uh, to try to eradicate one of those factors. For example, if we have research uh, to support that baldness is correlated with an increased uh, early mortality, that doesn't mean that we should try to tell people who are bald that they're not allowed to be bald, that they're inherently bad for being bald, um, and that we should not have babies with bald people. We should try to eradicate bald people from society because that's only a correlational link, right? We can't prove that baldness causes early mortality. And actually it's entirely possible that folks who are predisposed to have an early mortality in their life may actually just have like a higher likelihood to lose their hair, for example, right? The attitude that we have have, um, in adjusting or, or addressing this correlational link is really important because again, the medical community is really committed to this bit of like fat people are inherently bad. And so when they find a correlation between fatness and anything, the immediate response is therefore we must eradicate fatness and therefore fat people, which first of all sucks, um, but also isn't true, right? Like we're heaping all of this weight stigma and medical discrimination upon this population that there's no justification for that in the first place, which to be clear, even if there was, 
that still fucking sucks. That's like not an appropriate way to handle that. But I do just want to draw attention to the fact that not only does this suck and it's really fucking shitty and mean and discriminatory, it's also wrong. Another caveat that I want to point out here is that there are studies, I am sure uh, the people who hate me will leave some in the comments about like, I found one, I found one, that link um, a causal relationship between fatness and mortality. And I, I want to be clear here that when I say that there is very little research about this, what I mean is that there is very little good quality research, right? The academic community has relatively stringent standards about what is considered good quality or efficacious research. Um, and there are lots of studies that are done by people who have a heavy bias that have ha had funding from like weight loss companies, weight loss drugs, the pharmaceutical industry, for example, who have a vested interest in proving this correlation. We're gonna talk all about the money and the health insurance issue later. Um, but when I say that there is very little link of a causal relationship between fatness and mortality or disease, what I mean is that there is very little link of that relationship in good quality, like actually reputable research. And that's the research that we're interested in looking at and why it's so important for us to be conscientious consumers about information that we find on the internet because just because any Tom, Dick, or Harry found a link to like some random study that they found on, you know, somebody's blog from 2002 doesn't mean that it's good research and it doesn't mean that we should least of all live our lives by that standard. So this kind of raises the question then if we have all of this research to prove that fatness is at worst a neutral symptom um, and at best actually a positive impact on your health, why then do we have all of this hullabaloo about fatness being um, a disease and increasing our risk for dying and all of these types of things, right? Excellent question. Um, it might actually have something to do with a phenomenon that's called reverse causation. I'm gonna read you a quote um, because I really think that these people um, just summed it up best. So a study that I will link in the description in the Google doc uh, said, quote, reverse causation refers to the outcome causing a change in the exposure instead of the other way around. If the onset of diabetes resulted in the change of body weight such that a severe disease resulted in weight loss, this would result in an association between lower body weight and BMI and a higher rate of complications or mortality. Much of the research on the obesity paradox in diabetes measured composition, body composition, well beyond the onset of diabetes and therefore may be susceptible to the reverse causation bias. Essentially to mean, first of all, a lot of the research that's conducted about type two diabetes, this article is about fatness and type two diabetes and the uh, obesity paradox. The research that's conducted about type two diabetes is done well after the onset of symptoms. People are being evaluated well after they've received a diagnosis, that they've started to display symptoms and that they have a, a further track down this line um, of being diagnosed and experiencing type two diabetes. If we as a community observed lower weight loss um, or weight loss or lower body um, body weight being correlated with type two diabetes, it's entirely possible that the rhetoric around this would be people who are of low weight are at risk for developing diabetes which obviously is not the case. But the point here is that it's entirely possible that diabetes is causing weight gain in people. We can actually see this demonstrated in certain um, studies that diabetes does seem to be correlated with an increase in weight gain over time and not the other way around. So again, this is another important moment for us to address that just because there is a correlation between two things does not mean that there is a causal relationship between the two. And because the medical community is so filled with stigma and judgment and malice about fat people and body weight, it is entirely possible that we are drawing conclusions about diseases that are commonly associated with obesity as an incorrect or in an incorrect um, manner. It's entirely possible that type two diabetes type two diabetes causes people to be fat rather than the other way around. And this also holds true for lots of other serious illnesses. I'm gonna read you some other stuff. Hold on, I have to scroll on my outline, so give me a sec. Another thing that I wanna draw your attention to, I recently took a continued education unit course about weight stigma and the ethics of being a clinician around uh, eating disorder treatment and all of those things. Shout out to Nancy Ellis Ord Ordway, by the way, incredible clinician and very, very uh, succinct and like, or not succinct, um, clear, concise educator. But one of the things that I wanna draw your attention to is a study that she included in her course, um, which talks about the impact of weight stigma and judgment on people's health, because um, we know that weight stigma and judgment around fatness can cause chronic, chronic stress. That's been demonstrated in the research. We also know that chronic stress <laughs> tends to be correlated as a causal link for things like heart disease, for high blood pressure, for high cholesterol, and for diabetes. All of these things are things that are typically associated with fatness, but it's 
entirely possible that in trying to survive a world that fucking hates us, fat people are actually just being subjected to chronic stress and chronic trauma that correlates with negative health outcomes and then having those health outcomes blamed on them as their fault in the first place, which I don't even, we're not, we, we're gonna go into it later. Um, we're gonna talk about the emotional impact and my personal feelings about all of that, but I do just wanna draw your attention to the fact that again, we have a lot of research to support this idea that fatness is not actually the boogeyman that we as a culture have made it out to be, but in fact, all of the surrounding features and data and stigma and judgment um, around this disease could be causing people's negative health outcomes, but we as a, a society are just not having that conversation, apparently. One of the studies, again, I'm gonna link this in the description, verified this, but they found that 27% of the physiological dysfunction that's usually blamed on fatness could actually be more appropriately attributed to the impact of weight stigma instead. They were able to like verify this with real numbers. Again, this is what I'm talking about too when I say that it's important to look at good quality <laughs> research because this study did a lot of work to make sure that they were correctly attributing these symptoms to like the appropriate cause. Another analysis, <laughs> Uh, proof that those who had the greatest fear of fatness um, in self-report data, um, typically this was women, young people, and white people. Um, these were all the people who suffered the most from the BMI associated uh, morbidity and mortality symptoms. Okay, we're gonna talk about the impact of weight stigma and all of that in a second, but before we do, I want to draw your attention to something that I think is really important, which is that even if it were true that fatness is inherently bad and unhealthy and was causing all of this disease and early mortality in people, which again, see the previous chapter, it's not. Um, but even if that were true, right? The way that we as a society are going about addressing obesity or fatness is having the opposite impact than our uh, supposedly desired uh, intent, right? This is actually correlated with an increase in obesity rates, in, in weight gain, in body size over time. We can see this demonstrated clearly. I'll put a graph up for you. Um, and so again, even if this were true, that our society, uh, this assumption that our society makes that fatness is inherently unhealthy, the way that we as a society are addressing it is making it worse, right? <laughs> so I think it stands to reason then that we as a society and a culture need to adopt a different perspective about this because it's not fucking working. Yeah, so let's put a pin in that. We're gonna circle back to that, but let's talk about weight stigma for now. Okay, let's talk about weight stigma. Um, I think it's clear <laughs> the judgment, the malice uh, that we as a society assign to fatness and body weight and uh, obesity does a lot more harm, much more detrimental to people's health than their actual fatness is. Research has found uh, that fat people are at a higher risk for uh, psychological disorders like depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, eating disorders, and also an increased risk of suicide because of the way that the world treats them. One of the sources that I'm gonna link below also demonstrates that fat people are at a higher or increased risk for physical abuse and sexual assault as well. All of the psychosocial factors around obesity and fatness are, again, much more detrimental to people's health. I also wanna speak to this personally a little bit. I've talked about this on my social medias in like varying ways before. I made a TikTok way back in the day actually about how my fatness will never harm my health in the way that my eating disorder did. Um, and this is a take that I stand by because the judgment, the discrimination that fat people experience is so harmful and detrimental to your day-to-day -day life. I've been denied medical care. I've been medically gaslighted before. I finally found a doctor to chop my boobs off, thank God. Um, but it was like a whole fucking journey to find one. And that doesn't even cover like the actual day-to-day -day experience of, of realizing that the world is not made for you. And like generally speaking is really hostile towards you, right? There is just, it's difficult to quantify. And I think it's a hard thing to explain if you've never experienced it before. But the constant experience of like, I have to uh, look at a restaurant on Google Maps before I agree to go there with my friends because I don't know if the fucking chairs are gonna fit me. Um, and I have to Google the length of seat belts in cars before I decide to buy one because I don't know if it will fit all the way around my body. The impact of, of like, random people uh, yelling at you or or looking at you um, or judging you or being really shitty towards you. Lots of people have talked about how like after they've undergone significant weight loss that the world just treats you differently. This is a very real thing. I can vouch for this phenomenon as a person who hasn't been this fat my entire life. The way that the world treats me out is very different than it did when I was thin. You're largely invisible unless, of course, you're not because people hate you and people want to hate crime you for some reason, um, the impact of all of this, right? Like I can't go on roller coasters. I can't get on an airplane easily. Um, we had to buy special furniture for the office so that I can be comfortable here to like record and like do my job. All of this adds up to this picture of just like, generally speaking, feeling really fucking exhausted by the world 
treating you in this really hostile and shitty way. And I'm not saying this to like, like, ooh, feel bad for me. Like, it's not the, the point that I'm making here, but I want to demonstrate for people, especially those of you who are not aware, what it feels like to navigate the world as a plus size or a fat person. It wears on you. Like it does something to you to have to constantly contend with this, this truth that the world is not made for you. And like, realistically would probably um, be happy to see me never exist or to see me be eradicated from this earth. It's sad and it's shitty and it's irritating and it's enraging. And the thing about it that I think is most difficult is that you are constantly stuck in this place of having to decide whether you wanna chop off little bits of yourself, literally or figuratively, try to make your life easier or to stand by advocating for yourself, loving yourself, caring for yourself, and then facing the ensuing backlash from the world around you. And it's just something that like, again, it's difficult to to quantify, but the impact of it on your mental and physical um, or psychological health rather um, is something that we shouldn't be understating or writing off, especially because there's a lot of rhetoric about like, well, if you don't like being treated like shit, then like you should just lose weight, right? Like it's your fault. And I think that we should really as a culture <laughs> abandon this idea that fat people are being dramatic or being babies or want to be oppressed. Because again, it's something that is, it's difficult to quantify, but it is genuinely really impactful on your mental and psychological health. Yeah, I could go on and on about obviously how um, impactful and difficult this is, but I do also want to host this conversation from an intersectional point of view because that's really important work for us to be doing. I talked at the beginning about how that might be kind of activating for some folks, but this is a moment where I think it's really important to talk about it because that hypervigilance of existing as a fat person doesn't exist in a vacuum. And especially for people who have intersecting marginalized identities, we're talking about that mental and psychological distress and harm being amplified that much more, right? People who are living in fat, queer, disabled, indigenous, um, and also fat bodies are being marginalized to a much greater degree and they're experiencing a much greater uh, negative impact on their mental and psychological health. And we really have to acknowledge, again, that this doesn't exist in a vacuum and that we need to be advocating for everybody in this community um, and choosing or, or looking to uplift all of us. Because again, like I talked about at the beginning of the video, true liberation is in uplifting the most marginalized among us and recognizing then that that will mean all of us are being advocated for. Okay, so all of that said, we need to acknowledge then that weight stigma has been associated in the research as being correlated with people being less likely to, first of all, seek out health promoting behaviors of their own accord, but also being less likely to seek out medical care. The thing about this that especially fucking sucks is that first of all, being a fat person who is ridiculed or mocked for showing up at the gym or every time you go to the doctor, you're being gaslighted and poked and prodded literally or figuratively by a doctor and being shamed and judged and treated like shit or B because their concerns are invalidated and they're just not being um, heard, this will result in a couple of different outcomes. The first of which being that what could have been an acute and treatable issue ends up being a chronic and long-term and more difficult to treat issue because they weren't able to or didn't access safe medical care um, when they should have had access to that in the first place. But it can also mean that when we are not incorporating these uh, health promoting behaviors into our daily life, that our health gradually will decline over time. And this gets blamed on our fatness, right? Again, we talked before about how even if it were true uh, that fatness is correlated with disease and mortality, which it's not, even if that were true, the way that we as a society are addressing body size and weight is causing people to become fatter over time, this is what I'm talking about, right? If fat people were not ridiculed and shamed and judged for going to the gym, for example, or like, God forbid, wanting to buy active wear, it would be a lot more accessible, it would be a lot safer, and it would be a lot more fucking common for people of varying body sizes to engage in healthy, like uh, health promoting behaviors like exercise or like, you know, weight neutral nutrition and dietetics counseling and things like that. But because there is such a stigma around this, fat people especially are being driven away from these things that we know are associated with positive impact on your physical health and then having the uh, ensuing negative outcome on their health blamed on them and their fatness, which is like this shitty fucking cyclical feedback loop that's really fucking irritating to me, just like as a human, um, but especially as a clinician, when we talk about people like, wanting to uplift themselves and feel empowered and feel healthy and feel safe in their lives and in their bodies, they're actively being told not to do those things and then being judged and shamed and blamed for the outcome of not doing those things when they're denied the access to those things in the first place. It's fucking infuriating. It's really fucking irritating. And I think we need to acknowledge the truth of that because again, a lot of the paradigm around fatness and medical care is that fat people don't go to the doctor because they don't care or because they're lazy or because they're disgusting or because they're gross when actually the inverse is true. The uh, <laughs> There's no link or, or relationship in research between laziness or disgustingness 
fatness or a lack of desire to be alive uh, with fatness other than because people uh, are being judged and shamed because of weight stigma. You get it. Um, and so this attitude that fat people are just like inherently less worthy is really toxic and it's literally killing people. For what it's worth, this is not just happening in a medical context, to be clear. We also have documented proof that this type of discrimination is occurring uh, against fat people in all different areas of life. For example, um, we have documented proof that fat people have been denied access to living situations. They've been uh, denied from things like apartments or being approved for houses and things like that. They have also been uh, documented in research to be discriminated at in the workplace. Um, I'm not laughing because it's funny. It's just like insane to me um, that there are real documented cases of fat people being fired more often, hired less, disciplined more harshly and more likely to be disciplined at work. And yet we have very very little legal or federal legal legislation about protections for people based on their body size. There are very few places in the United States where there are actual laws on the books preventing discrimination of this type. And yet again, we have this discourse about how fat people want to be oppressed and they're being dramatic and none of this is true. And like, this is true, right? This is documented. We can see this clearly, um, both in the research and self-report data that fat people are being discriminated against purely on the basis of their body size. And again, I think this is a, another important moment for us to pause and talk about why we need to be having this conversation from an intersectional lens then. I know that there were people who were a little mad at me <laughs> in um, a recent video that I made about Bethany Beal. We're talking about how uh, insulting and irritating it is to me as a fat person to listen to a white cis het woman talk about how brave she is for buying a size medium rather than a size small. And I got accused of doing the oppression Olympics thing, but I think this is an important moment for us to pause and talk about hosting this conversation from an intersectional lens because it's not about one type of experience being more valid or more worthy than the other, but the truth is that those experiences are not the same. Um, and being discriminated against because of your body size is simply not the same as experiencing sadness or insecurity about your body when you do in fact exist in a societally approved of body. The truth unfortunately is that the world is just by and large more accepting of thin and straight sized people than it is of plus sized people. And it's not that your experiences as a straight or a uh, straight sized or thin person are not traumatizing or difficult or painful because they are, right? Um, I think it's also important to acknowledge that even uh, just the fear of one day becoming a fat person is enough to create psychological distress. The research has supported that we as a society have made such a, a boogeyman out of fatness that even just the looming idea that you could be fat one day is enough to be correlated with mental illness and eating disorders in thin and straight sized people. So it's not that that pain and trauma and difficulty isn't valid because it is. Is, right? It's real and it's true. And it's also very important for us to talk about that. And the experience that straight size people and plus size people are going to have in regards to body liberation, um, self-love, body positivity, it's not the same experience, right? I want to encourage people to remember that when you are a straight sized or thin person and you have this insecurity or difficulty or pain or trauma about your body size or shape, the work that you're trying to do is in aligning the way that you see yourself with the way that the world sees you, right? Inherently worthy, good enough, worthy of being here and being loved and being seen and being being valued, right? Because again, this is the societal perspective by and large, not in all cases, but for the most part um, of thin and straight sized and non-marginalized uh, bodied people, right? The work that plus size folks and fat folks are doing, especially those who have intersecting identities that cause them to be marginalized to a further degree, the work that they are doing is learning how to love themselves, to accept themselves, to see themselves as worthy, even though the world has told them, you're not, you never will, Will be, nobody else thinks this, no one will think that you're worthy of love or acceptance or belonging, everyone will laugh at you, no one will take you seriously, and we're going to continue to marginalize you, oppress you, to cause you to experience backlash and violence and discrimination and stigma because you're doing that work. It's not that the work that both sides are doing isn't worthy and valid, valid because it is, but it's not the same. And to insinuate or to assert that it is the same, in my opinion, is not only disingenuous, it's also hurtful, right? This is why I said having this conversation from an intersectional point of view is really important, especially because the body positivity movement has already been co-opted by thin white women, right? The body positive movement in its origins was created and uplifted by people in black and brown fat and plus size bodies because there was a desire to uplift people who were living in fat and black and brown and marginalized bodies and to create an awareness about their inherent worthiness, their value, their uh, need and, and worthiness of love and belonging and all of these things. And this movement got co-opted 
somewhere along the way, let's be honest, it's because we as white people um, are addicted to centering ourselves um, in experiences that aren't really about us. And this movement became about cellulite on your thighs and hip dips, right? And um, hunching yourself over in Instagram reels to try to force yourself to have roles so that you can make a TikTok saying that like, this is okay and your body is okay. And like, again, it's not that that's not true because it is, right? And also the movement was originally <laughs> intended to be an act of rebellion. It was intended to create a social discourse uh, to disrupt and subvert the white supremacist ideals that marginalize and oppress people in marginalized bodies and also people in fat, black and brown bodies. When we talk about wanting to create a greater social awareness about body positivity and about love for ourselves and feeling like we inherently are worthy and like we belong, we need to have the conversation from an intersectional place. And that means then that if you are a person who possesses privilege in regards to this conversation, the work for us is sometimes learning how to shut the fuck up and get out of the way and recognize that people are already doing this work, people are already speaking about this, and the work for us as privileged people is to uplift those voices rather than to speak over top of them, right? Again, I wanna be clear, the folks who are doing work around body positivity, regardless of their body size um, or how the world perceives them, um, that that work is valid and it's important and it's it's worthy of being uplifted and celebrated, right? Um, it's not that that pain is not real. I do really wanna validate that, especially because it is true that the way that we perceive ourselves is oftentimes not in alignment with the way that the world perceives us. And so these insecurities and these fears can be very traumatizing. They are very traumatizing for a lot of people. And it's important that we acknowledge that and honor that, right? And again, it's important that we acknowledge that the cultural and societal response to doing this work is going to be different, subject to the way that your body is perceived by the world, right? It's important in this conversation that we talk about how our uh, ex external experience um, either draws us closer to or distances us from social and political power and capital, right? It is simply disingenuous to say that our physical appearance has no impact on our social capital and our ability to access power, because it does, right? And so when we possess privilege in this area, we need to be willing to acknowledge that and to honor that again, the, the backlash, the violence, the discrimination, those are things that are going to be experienced by people who live in plus size, in fat, in marginalized black and brown bodies. Um, and that work is going to be inherently different and will also have a very different impact on your mental and psychological health, your physical health also, right? The impact of discrimination and marginalization and societal violence is not the same as the, the impact of the like psychological and mental distress that we experience simply from having the body dysmorphia, the fears, traumas, and psychological distress of like wanting our bodies to look up a way that we don't necessarily perceive them to be. I hope that that makes sense. I wanna be clear, I'm open to feedback about this. As always, you guys are welcome to let me know what your thoughts and feelings are in the comments. I know that that's gonna be very activating for some people. I personally think it's important to host that conversation as part of this journey. This is also why this video just kept multiplying and getting bigger because there's a lot of nuance here. Um, it's a difficult topic to talk about concisely. I think it's just amorphous in nature. So please, again, feel free to leave me comments. Let me know what your thoughts and feelings are about it. And again, I wanna encourage people, this is the moment where I think it's important for us to look inward, to be doing that introspection, um, to be surveying whether or not our anger, fear, frustration is a result of our discomfort in not having our experience centered, especially because again, as people with privilege, um, we, and I say we on purpose, we um, have uh, usually like a reaction of self-righteous indignation in not having our experiences centered and talked about and uplifted as the most important. Um, and it's, healthy for us to recognize that and be willing to step back when it's necessary. Okay, that little diatribe over, I wanna round out this section by talking about, um, I don't know what I wanna talk about. <laughs> okay, that little diatribe out of the way, I wanna round out this section by talking about how weight stigma, in addition to the fact that it affects all of the quality of life stuff that we've already covered, it's also positively linked to weight gain. We touched on this a little bit earlier, the truth is that the way that we as a society deal and address obesity is causing people to get fatter over time. And so I think it's really odd um, that for a society that is so fixated on people's health um, and about wanting to eradicate fatness, um, that we are still committed to this tack that causes people to be fatter over time. And I think it's it's Im an important question to ask, like why, right? Why is that happening? Especially because the way that we address fatness and body size, not only is causing people to be fatter over time, but it's also 
also contributing to uh, an increase in the amount of eating disorders and like related disorders that people are developing. So I wanna talk to you guys about eating disorders and the impact that all of that has on your health. So we have arrived then at the portion of the video where I can finally explain to you why I, as a therapist and a clinician, am talking about fatness and fat uh, positivity and body liberation and all of these things. And it's because the intersection between this topic and the topic of uh, eating disorders and our development of eating disorders is important to me, obviously. Again, I've already talked about this, but not only because it's something that I've survived as a person, but also because it's an area of practice in my clinical work. And there is a lot of interesting research for us to dissect and talk about in terms of fatness and the way that we as a, a world treat fat people and the impact that that has on your psychological health in regards to eating disorders. I wanna start by talking about something that I, in the CEU that I recently took, this will probably stick with me to the end of my days. The quote from this course was that all eating disorders are a result of dieting. And I think this is an important thing for us as a culture to just like internalize and remember. I know that this is a hot take, um, but it, it's my opinion uh, that all intentional uh, attempts at weight loss with very, very, very few exceptions are disordered in nature. I think it's a really difficult thing to get around because the truth is that diets, uh, even though we call them lifestyle changes or you know a wellness cleanse or <laughs> a juice cleanse, whatever the fuck you wanna call them, diets are uh, a self-imposed famine. Um, again, is one of the, the quotes from the CEU that I took. And I really wanna encourage people to think about dieting and weight loss from an evolutionary perspective, because when we look at our genetics and the way that our bodies have developed the truth is that depriving ourselves of food activates a very primal and genetic instinct on behalf of your body to say, oh my God, we're dying. Something terrible is happening. This is something that we are not meant to be doing to ourselves. And yet we as a culture have normalized this. It's just like, hmm, part of January 1st, it's totally normal. And no, it's not. No, it's not. This is quite literally self-harm that we as a culture have not only normalized um, to the degree that it's just something that everybody does, but we're actively encouraging it. We're prescribing it. As medical practitioners, we are prescribing this to patients in the hopes that this will increase their health and then being surprised Pikachu when actually it causes them to be generally generally speaking, much, much more unhealthy over the long term. Also, as a quick caveat, I wanna be super clear. When I say that all attempts at dieting or weight loss, intentional diets or weight loss um, are disordered eating, I'm not saying that all of those people have an eating disorder. I am planning on making a, a video where I tease out the nuance between those two things because disordered eating and eating disorders are not the same. However, I do think that diets and intentional attempts at weight loss are most often um, disordered eating and again, are healthy are unhealthy and not a thing that I would recommend that anybody do, especially because dieting and intentional attempts at weight loss are uplifted by this societal belief that weight is a thing that we can and should control, which is a myth, right? I wanna talk especially about calories in and calories out because this is the way that a lot of people say weight loss is not that hard. It's such a simple equation. All you have to do is be aware of your calories in versus your calories out and you'll lose weight. First of all, that's a stupid fucking saying because it's not true. Um, it sucks and it's really fucking me. Uh, but it's also wrong, right? And so I wanna talk to you guys about the calories in, calories out perspective before we talk more about eating disorders and diet specifically, because there is a lot for us to unpack here. Okay, so calories in, calories out is the most commonly pointed to excuse for why it is okay for us as a society to tough love fat people out of being fat. The perspective being that if you don't like being treated like shit, then just lose weight, which like, what a compassionate take. But second of all, this is wrong, right? That's not actually how our bodies work. There's like 3,000 different reasons uh, that this is wrong and flawed. And so I wanna talk about a couple of them. The first of which being uh, research about our gut microbiomes. There is an article listed in the description that discussed the role that our particular gut microbiome plays in the way that our body digests and uh, utilizes the energy that we consume in the form of food. We can see from this study that those who are more likely to just be natural naturally straight sized or thin people actually have been demonstrated to have a difference in their gut microbiome. They performed transfers of their gut microbiome um, between naturally thin people and naturally fat people, which sounds disgusting to be clear, but they did it. And actually it was related or, or correlated with the naturally fat people losing weight when they received a transfer from the people whose gut microbiome or from thin people's gut microbiome. What this leads us to understand then is that this idea that all people are naturally thin people, and if you just try hard enough, if you're just a good enough person, then you can be thin is a myth. This is a lie, this is not true. The truth actually is that it seems like uh, at many places, there are genetic and biological barriers that will prevent people who are genetically and biologically predisposed to be fat from becoming a thin. This is just simply not a thing that all people can accomplish 
stylish. And I think, first of all, moralizing the idea of being a thin person as a thing to look up to and to aspire to is gross. Um, but also, again, this is a fallacy, right? We can see that this is not true and that the, the research seems to lend itself to the belief that people who are able to eat whatever they want and exercise very little and still maintain a societally approved of and straight-sized body are probably not able to do that because they're just better fucking people than you. It's because their gut microbiome and a bunch of other factors, we're gonna talk about those in a second, um, just lend itself to their body naturally being that way, which is part of the biological diversity of human beings. I don't understand why this is like a hot take or a difficult thing for people to internalize, but the truth is that people, based on their genetics, based on their heritage, based on their biology, are predisposed to look and think and, and act slightly differently right? People, like, don't get me wrong, I'm the first person on planet Earth to be, like, the hippy-dippy lady who's like, we're all one human race, but also, like, that's not really the case, though, right? We are separated by biological determinants, determinants that impact the way that our, in this case, bodies show up in the world, and that that's fine, right? That's okay, and that's something that we should honor as being true, rather than trying to push this narrative that all people are just secretly thin people on the inside if they would stop being so disgusting, because, like, fucking you. The other thing that I want to talk to you about is that calories um, on nutrition facts labels, calories are an estimation anyways. There's actually a lot of interesting research about how the calorie representations that we see on nutrition labels might not be that accurate, actually. Um, first of all, let's talk about what a calorie actually is. There is a formula that helps us to determine what a calorie actually is. A calorie, as we commonly refer to it in nutrition and dietetics, is actually a kilocalorie in science, but a kilocalorie is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. Obviously, we don't calculate calories by seeing how much we raise the temperature of water. We did used to do that. It was very lengthy and difficult. Nobody fucking does that anymore. Um, and so now a lot of it is formed on estimations, especially based on the early tests that folks conducted around particular foods that were used then to inform later estimations about calories later on. So this leads us then uh, to the point that calories listed on nutrition labels can be inaccurate up to a, a margin of plus or minus 20%. There was one Australian study that found actually that uh, uh, food contained anywhere between 13% less and 61% more energy um, or nutrition nutrient components um, than the packaging stated. Um, so again, I just really want to drive home the point that the idea that we can correctly calculate how many calories we're taking in is a fallacy in the first place. And so even if the idea that calories in, calories out was a reliable formula for losing weight, which it's not, we're gonna get into that in a second, you can't accurately estimate how many fucking calories you're taking in or putting out. Because on top of that, estimating our accurate, um, or our actual calories burned through exercise or things like that is also a fucking estimation. In order to get a real or more reliable take on how many calories you're actually burning with any given exercise, you would have to be hooked up to very complex machinery that is uh, calibrated to be aware and cognizant of your specific body, your biology, your health conditions, all of the very intricate and um, intimate parts of your health data that would allow us to accurately determine how many calories you're burning. So to summarize, calories on nutrition facts are an estimation, so we can't really accurately verify how many calories we're taking in, and we also can't accurately verify, accurately verify how many calories we're burning via exercise, so we don't really have any idea of how many calories are coming in versus going out. So the idea that it's just a simple formula that you sit down and use fucking MyFitnessPal to do, which fuck that app, by the way, don't ever fucking download MyFitnessPal. All eating disorder therapists hate my fitness pal. Um, fun fact. But the idea that it's just a simple formula that you can use and then profit is a lie. That's not true. Okay, hi, hello. It's Mickey and Post here really quick. Uh, before we move on, I also wanted to point out something that I forgot to mention while we were recording because clearly I was a little distracted, which is that even if we could successfully do the calories in, calories out equals weight loss thing, which you can't, um, it's also important to acknowledge the truth that our bodies are biologically primed to lose weight in different ways. And so this message that we get sold that if you follow the calories in, calories out uh, dogma that your body will look like a supermodel or a celebrity or this particular person whose body you idealize, 
that is a lie. That's not true. And so especially this idea that we can shave adipose tissue off of our stomachs or our thighs or our butts or our backs or whatever area somebody is insecure about is fundamentally a lie um, and is also a flaw with the uh, calories in, calories out belief. On top of that, I wanna talk about the fact that not all calories are created equal, right? The idea that calories in, calories out is a reliable or a safe way to promote weight loss is founded on the belief that calories are all created equal, which is not fucking true. I think when we sit down and like think critically about it for like one second, the truth is that 100 calories of almonds, for example, is not going to nourish or fuel your body in the same way that 100 calories of canola oil would, right? Nor are they going to be satisfying, nor are they going to create the same uh, impact in your hunger or satiety cues or in your body function, right? We can all agree that having a diet that incorporates a vast range of uh, nutrient components and that also is uh, guided by a desire to fuel all of our body's different necessary functions is important. And yet, calories in, calories out is promoted as the reliable way to lose weight and then it's a perfectly morally neutral thing to just subsist on a diet of 1,300 calories of celery for like an ungodly amount of time when that's not fucking true. And I think it's also important for us to talk about the fact that calories in, calories out gets pointed to as this formula that is reliable and it's safe and you can just eat, as long as you're eating the right amount and the right number of calories, it doesn't really matter what you're taking in, which is unhealthy, right? And so then the line logical following then is that actually it's not about health even. If we as a society are uplifting this simple formula to lose weight and not addressing the fact that we're not being aware of our nutrient intake or our macros or anything like that, it seems like it's not about health. Maybe it hasn't been about health from the fucking beginning. And so this idea that we should be uplifting calories in, calories out, it's not only a reliable thing, but a safe thing to do, has nothing to do with actually wanting people to be healthy so much as it is to wanting people to be thin. We want people to be smaller. That's not about health. That has nothing to do with your actual health outcomes. And it only tells us about your body size, which is fucking disordered. Another thing that we need to address in regards to calories in, calories out is the concept of set weights. Set weights are a really important thing for us to be aware of because research is continuing to, we're developing or, or seeing more robust research coming out in recent years about the concept of set weights being a valid and real thing that is in fact biologically true for most people. Set weights are when your hypothalamus, we talked about your hypothalamus in the horror movie uh, video, I'll put that somewhere. <laughs> Your hypothalamus is the structure in your brain that helps your body to maintain something called homeostasis. Homeostasis refers to like things staying the same, essentially. Your body temperature is a great example of homeostasis. It does not matter if you are in 90 degree heat or four degree cold, your body makes a co consistent and constant effort to maintain the 98.6 temperature on the inside because that's what your organs and all of your stuff needs to function, right? Set weights are when your hypothalamus, in an attempt to maintain homeostasis, causes your body to, uh, actively try to maintain this particular weight. There is evidence to suggest that everybody's biological set weights seem to be um, like roughly around the same number as the people in your family and the people you shall share genetic material with. Likely this is uh, informed by our heritage and like, for example, the conditions that our ancestors grew up in or existed in rather, it's like an evolution thing. <laughs> doesn't matter. The point that I'm making here is that set weights are a real thing that your brain will try to get you to maintain. And so even if we do embrace the idea that like throw your macros out the window, who gives a fuck what nutrients you're consuming, we'll just care about calories in, calories out, and then therefore you will lose weight. That's not fucking true either because sometimes your brain will actively sabotage you again because diets are a self-imposed famine and your body will go, whoa, 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 hold on a minute. What the fuck is this? We're dying. And so it will hold on to all of the nutrition, all of the food that you consume if you're trying to lose weight to try to keep you at this weight because your body interprets this as danger. Your body interprets this as a famine or as a shortage of food or as like a period of of danger um, that it's, it's trying to help you survive, right? Um, the other thing about set weights that are important for us to talk about are weight cycling. We are gonna talk about weight cycling in a minute, I think, hold on. We're gonna talk about weight cycling in a hot second, but I wanna draw people's attention to the concept of set weights, A, because it's important to recognize that your body biologically is just not going to conform to this idea of calories in, calories out. Again, even if we could 
get past the fact that that has nothing to do with the appropriate nutrition uh, for your body and that we can't accurately estimate how many calories we're taking in, let alone burning. The truth is that it's entirely possible, it's likely actually, uh, that your brain will try to keep you at this consistent weight that has been biologically determined for you to be the healthiest for your body and for your functioning. So in summary, <laughs> calories out, ca calories in, calories out is stupid. It's inaccurate. It's not healthy. It has no foundational basis in actually being a reliable intervention intervention for your determinants of health and largely is motivated by a desire to be thin and to be smaller again, which is fucking disordered. So don't fucking recommend. And also, again, it's important to acknowledge that this idea that we can force our bodies into submission by depriving it of food and it's like necessary nutrient intake is an act of self-harm. This is usually an act of self-harm that we're gonna talk about the nuance in why people diet in a minute, um, but it is inherently an act of self-harm that is not going to lend itself to an improved outcome in your mental health. Okay, so all of that said, I think it really goes to illustrate the point that this culturally agreed upon paradigm that we have, that weight is something that can and should be controlled. It's not only false, but again, this is harmful to your health. It's not going to lead anywhere good. On top of that, I wanna talk about a piece of what I think is under or criminally underreported uh, data, which is that we have no reliable data to analyze the impact of long-term weight loss because it's so rare that like there's not enough people for us to fucking analyze. Um, we talked earlier about how important it is to interrogate and analyze research for its efforts efficacy and it's like uh, ability to be like, it's like hold up to scrutiny. Um, this is one of those moments, right? When we talk about long-term weight loss, the statistics are pretty fucking damning. This number varies depending on where you get the number. I'm reporting the lowest number here just to be on the safe side and to be generous. But the truth is that after five years between 80 and up to 95% of people will regain all of the weight that they have lost. And often those people will actually regain more late weight than they originally lost. So when I say that we have very little data to analyze in regards to permanent weight loss, this is what I mean. You'll see lots and lots of studies that talk about people's health outcomes one year after weight loss. That's not long enough. That's not long enough. People who, again, especially people who have biology on their side can uh, effectively lose weight for that amount of time. But what we really need to be looking at are the long-term outcomes and statistics about this phenomenon because the truth is that this is just a nearly impossible thing for most people to do. And this societal assumption that it's in fact very normal and common and it's a thing that everybody does so long as you have the right willpower, so long as you're good enough, so long as you have control over yourself, you'll be fine. That's not true. That's not real. That's not founded in the research. And again, this is not even a phenomenon that we can effectively study because so few fucking people have done it that it creates a sample size that's so small that it's difficult for good, objective, and uh, robust research to really effectively study. Also, listen, I already know somebody's gonna be in my comments being like, well, actually, I." that's great. Listen, if you are a person who has lost a significant amount of weight and you've kept it off for after five years, first of all, that's none of my goddamn business. And I, that's great. Like if that's a thing that was positive and healthy and helpful for you, then like go off. I love that for you, big thumbs up. And the truth is that again, in the empirical and objective data, that's not a phenomenon that's well supported as being a realistic option or outcome for most people. The thing that irritates me the fucking most about making these videos where I've poured hours of my time and energy and attention into collecting this data that again, like I, am annoying and care very deeply about the robust and um, you know, like like whether this research is reliable, I care a lot about the nature of that, um, is when people are in my comments giving me their anecdotal experiences as if that invalidates my point. That's not how research works, babe. Okay, so remember when I said earlier uh, that it's entirely possible that we're using fatness as a scapegoat um, in this conversation about health and um, mortality? This, this is what I'm talking about. The fact that we as a society have said and continue to perpetuate this myth that fatness will be the thing that kills you, that uh, single-handedly destroys your health and overrides all of your other determinants of health, uh, and yet we're not having a conversation about the detrimental impacts of weight uh, cycling, uh, speaks volumes, I think, about where we're at culturally with this issue. I also wanna point out that people who are doing this in the like 
athlete way, in the like, I'm just a fitness bro way. This is just as fucking detrimental to you. Um, I don't care if you're doing it because you're you're drinking BCAAs every day and you, you chug a protein shake every day. The truth is that these cyclical changes in our weight from losing to gaining to losing to gaining, cutting to bulking, cutting to bulking, this is not good for your body. Biologically, this is not something that our bodies were meant to do. And engaging in this behavior repeatedly is linked to all of these negative outcomes for your health. And so I don't give a fuck if it means that you like look really ripped and cut and you like love this about yourself or if people are doing this because we're, we're losing weight for an important function like our weddings or things like that. This is a, a phenomenon that is societally and culturally approved of, but that doesn't make it healthy. And that's very important for us to be aware of. Weight cycling is something that, again, I think is criminally understudied. Um, there's a lot of studies about it. I just care about it a lot. And it's really irritating to me when people don't talk about it because it's actually very detrimental to your health. Weight cycling, I'm gonna read you a really long list. I'm straight up just gonna read you this off of my outline. Give me two seconds. Weight cycling uh, has been linked in the research to developing eating disorders, other psychological disorders, a slowed metabolism, meaning that your body burns less calories at rest and during exercise, obesity, type two diabetes, hypertension, cancer, bone fracture, and death. And yet, somehow, fatness is the thing that's gonna fucking kill us all. On top of that, it has also been demonstrated to increase our weight over time. Remember, like five minutes ago when we talked about how the way that our society approaches uh, the topic of obesity and fatness is making us fatter? This is what I was talking about. Uh, this is also at the subject of a lot of discourse for fat folks now, because the truth is that if people had not been subjected to this crushing pressure to lose weight, to diet, especially from an early age, the truth is that a lot of people would have found a relatively stable body weight and just stayed there for most of their lives. Um, this weight cycling phenomenon does correlate with people's body sizes going up over time. And oftentimes by the, folk, by the time that folks reach a place where they've realized that dieting is not effective, that this is not a healthy thing for me to be doing, that it's destroying my mental health, that it's suffocating me, that it's stealing my joy and it's stealing my life, we've gone through this cycle a couple of times, right? And so at that point then, people's body sizes tend to be at the larger end of the BMI because we have done this so many times and that biologically is correlated with your body weight going up over time. This is again, the point that I'm trying to make here, which is that we use fatness as a scapegoat and we link it as, because it's correlated with the onset of particular diseases that we say, therefore fatness is the problem when actually the truth is that the disordered approach that we take to weight loss and to dieting is likely the culprit for a lot of folks in their bodies looking the way that they do. I also wanna be clear here to pause and say that uh, gaining weight and being a fat person is morally neutral, right? Um, your body size increasing over time, this is not a thing that I'm pointing to as being bad, but I do want to acknowledge and also talk about my own experience um, with the grief that a lot of fat folks have because I know for me specifically, the realization that if I had just been left the fuck alone and had not experienced this disordered and pathological desire to lose weight and to shrink my body from the time that I was a child that I, first of all, would have lost a lot less of my life and a lot less of my joy, but also would not have experienced the grief and the trauma that I have around weight loss and, and food in my body, that I'd have a very different relationship with food and exercise in my body. It's difficult, right? This is a trauma that a lot of people walk through. And so I, while I want to be clear that fatness is morally neutral, this is not a bad thing. It's also important to pause and talk about how this disordered approach that we take to weight loss has caused people to lose years of their life and joy and to permanently alter their relationship with food and their bodies. And that's a thing that a lot of people have grief over and that that's okay, right? It's okay to have grief about that. That does not mean that you are like a traitor <laughs> to the body positive movement, especially because the nuance around folks who diet to try to avoid being uh, marginalized is critical here. There is a lot of discourse about people, especially celebrities, losing weight and how they're a traitor to the body positive movement. And I do wanna pause here and also address that the way that folks seek to align themselves with social capital and power, yes, it does negatively affect the movement, and also it's important for us to humanize that, right? Um, I think the truth is that a lot of people, if given the opportunity, would choose to align themselves <laughs> uh, closer to this nexus of power and social capital that a lot of people ultimately are striving for. This is like really at the center of the conversation around privilege. This is why also I said that we as people with privilege oftentimes have a hard time with not having our experiences centered because it's a human desire to want to be as close to this nexus of power as we can. Um, and so 
I also want to just pause here and acknowledge and like address that there are some people who will be fat, who are fat, who won't embrace body positivity and body liberation and that doesn't make them bad people, right? That doesn't mean that we should finger point at them or that people who have tried weight loss or are trying weight loss or have been pressured into bariatric surgery or other things like that. This is not to say that those people are bad people or that we as a community or a culture should look down on those people either. Um, I wanna be clear, I don't recommend any of those things because again, dieting is disordered, bariatric surgery is barbaric and dehumanizing and also correlated with its own set of really problematic negative outcomes. And we can humanize and acknowledge that people in wanting to not experience the pain and the trauma that comes with marginalization may sometimes make choices that are counterintuitive to the movement of body liberation and things like that. And that like, I, I get it is all I'm saying. That's the point that I'm making here. Also for what it's worth in regards to the conversation of weight cycling, cause that's how we got here in the first place. Uh, weight cycling is particularly detrimental or at least the detrimental impacts of this are particularly um, or, or more strongly associated with folks in the normal BMI category. And this is because folks who start dieting at a normal BMI category are more likely to experience a significant drop in weight, proportionally anyways, and that their body will then start to do the thing where like, for example, it starts to digest your organs or pull muscle mass from other places in your, not literally, like in a figurative sense, um, it starts to pull muscle mass uh, in order to keep itself functioning and keep itself alive. And this in your body is associated with like, right, I'm starving, right? <laughs> this is bad. Um, my physical faculties are shutting down and so this weight cycling phenomenon is particularly sharp in folks who start dieting in the normal BMI category because your body will try to rebound more aggressively. It is much more likely that folks who start dieting and start intentional attempts at weight loss, especially like significant weight loss, will rebound in a way where they gain more weight than they originally lost and they experience a sharper vacillation between these two things. And this is correlated with a, a greater increase in body size overall when we observe weight cycling in the long term. So again, for what it's worth, it will negatively affect the health of all people uh, involved in this. This is not an issue that only fat people should care about, I guess is what I'm saying. So all of that said, this finding, um, this perspective is what underpins the health at every size approach for a lot of clinicians because the perspective there is, isn't it healthier for a person, regardless of their body size, to be, first of all, loving and accepting of themselves generally for their psychological and mental health, but also to be not chasing after this disordered behavior that will negatively affect their health outcomes in the long term. And so even if somebody is in the overweight or obese category of the BMI, which again, the BMI is bullshit, but if we're playing by like the medical community's rules, isn't it healthier then for a person who, even if they are overweight or obese, to have a consistent and stable body size over time that doesn't uh, weight cycle, which is associated with all of these negative health outcomes, and to be encouraging a focus on health promoting behaviors that uplift and empower this person to love themselves, to care for themselves, and to engage in behaviors like exercise, like caring about having a nutritionally dense and complete diet, about being socially connected, about making time for rest and relaxation, all of these things that are associated with like positive health outcomes over time. Wouldn't it make sense then that we just say, oh, well, <laughs> if you're fat, that's fine. It is entirely possible for us, uh, you know, as like mental health clinicians, but also of like the greater medical community to say, we are accepting you the way that you are. And if you want to lose weight, that's something that a doctor can help you do. Again, I don't agree with that perspective, but whatever. But for the most part, we can talk about how to create a greater uh, positive impact on your life, on your health, on your overall experience on planet earth um, that doesn't have anything to do with your weight. Doesn't it make more sense to uplift and to center our focus on behaviors and on factors in your environment, especially in regards to like social justice um, and our socioeconomic status that will promote a, a better outcome for you in the long term. This is why, like the frustration for a lot of fat liberation folks and for uh, specifically eating disorder therapists, this is why we're so frustrated with this issue because the truth is that oftentimes when folks do present to therapy for a focus on disordered eating or a contentious relationship with food or their body, that they have oftentimes at this point suffered years of trauma that before we can even have a conversation about incorporating health promoting behaviors, about guiding ourselves towards this, this ideal of uh, health and longevity, we first have to deal with this trauma. We have to unpack all of the damage that's been created and all of the internalized core beliefs that this person has because society has caused this person to believe that they are inherently unworthy 
unworthy and are also going to die because of their body size. The bulk of eating disorder <laughs> work oftentimes is trauma work that we have to do before we can even address the practicality of what you're eating, how much you're eating, how often you're eating, your attitude toward that eating, all of that is later work. The work that we first have to do is unlearning all of the trauma that the world has heaped upon you first and it is so endlessly fucking frustrating, especially to watch small children and teenagers be indoctrinated into this belief that will ultimately, first of all, bite them in the ass, but second of all, cause them to experience an amount of trauma that, that first of all, no one in their lifetime should experience, but also that they don't need to experience, right? Like it's heartbreaking to watch teenagers and children internalize these beliefs, especially because their parents or their mothers have internalized these beliefs and they're passed down generationally. And to know that that child will likely present for therapy later in their adult life um, and that they'll have to unpack all of this stuff that they should have never learned in the first place. If we as a world and as a society could just let fat people exist as morally neutral people um, and acknowledge and accept that those people are not only worthy of being here, that they are uh, valued and worth loving, that people do love them, and also that it is entirely possible for us to have a conversation about how to uplift and promote their health and well-being and, and not have that conversation revolve around the topic of weight loss. The truth about this issue, unfortunately, is that as clinicians, if we are even entertaining the idea um, that dieting or weight loss is a healthy or okay thing to do, let alone prescribing it to our clients, uh, that this is related and, and lends itself to our clients being endangered and developing a whole host of psychological issues, uh, eating disorders chief among them. One of the things that has stuck with me the most as a weight neutral and like fat positive clinician is the truth that if we as clinicians were prescribing the behaviors that are often prescribed to fat people in eating disorder recovery to thin people, that we would be prescribing them eating disorders and that everybody would be really fucked upset about that, that that's an unethical and shitty fucking thing to do. And yet it's a thing that we as a society, as an academic community, as a discipline have just accepted that this is a normal thing to do. One of the things that this is like, especially what fucking pushes my goddamn buttons about eating disorder treatment and recovery is that it is entirely possible and like somewhat common for folks who are fat and who after having done this cycle of years and years of eating uh, disorders and weight cycling and, and finally coming to the realization that like, oh my God, it was never me. It was never about me. I was never the problem. And I want to get off of this godforsaken carousel is that this person might present to an eating disorder therapist only to be prescribed the behavior that got them in this mess in the first place. And that that therapist in prescribing that wouldn't be in violation of their ethical code or their uh, discipline um, rules. And and, and rules and statutes, that this is a perfectly okay and acceptable thing to do is fucking mind blowing and also fucking infuriating. This is also why I think it's important for therapists, especially to be having a greater conversation about our ethics and responsibilities in regards to eating disorder treatment and weight stigma. This is why I took that CEU, for example, because the truth is that people who are existing in larger bodies are going to experience a different level of care um, than folks who are in straight sized or societally approved of bodies. Again, this is a callback to the plea that I made earlier um, to host this conversation from an intersectional perspective because the truth is that in, uh, again, even just trying to pursue care for ourselves and unlearning these behaviors, fat people and especially uh, black and brown and marginalized people are not going to experience the same level of care. Even in the DSM, the diagnosis uh, criteria for eating disorders have barriers that prevent people in larger bodies from having their diagnosis legitimized. For those of you who don't know, the most common barrier that fat people run into in having an eating disorder diagnosis for anorexia, for example, um, is that you have to meet a particular criteria about your body weight. Most commonly, people in larger bodies are diagnosed with atypical anorexia, meaning that they exhibit all of the behaviors, the signs, the symptoms, the um, problems of anorexia nervosa, except that they're fat. And so they get a separate diagnosis that oftentimes is delegitimized and is not taken seriously by folks in the medical community. And it can also be a reason that folks in larger bodies are denied entry into residential facilities that are uh, specifically for eating disorder recovery. The fact that this even exists is so fucking infuriating, first of all, but also again, an, an important moment for us to talk about the way that people in larger bodies and especially marginalized bodies are going to be treated differently than their straight sized or normal BMI counterparts. Wait, even, just cause you're, even if your behaviors are all the same? Yeah. 
if you're fat and you have all of the behaviors of anorexia nervosa, you don't get that diagnosis. The other real shit about this too is that uh, even if a therapist is a fat positive or weight neutral therapist, we can't disregard DSM criteria. We are morally and ethically mandated to abide by the diagnostic criteria as it exists. And so if you misdiagnose someone in the effort of trying to be an inclusive and weight positive clinician that you can actually get in trouble for this. Like a lot of clinicians are being, for lack of a better word, their hands are tied behind their backs um, in regards to trying to provide our clients with the care that they deserve. This also um, goes along with what a lot of survivors of eating disorders already know to be true, um, which is that the societal response to your eating disorder is entirely different based on what your body size is. Because if you are a thin person who loses weight because of a uh, eating disorder, then we are concerned for you. We're afraid for you and we wanna help you. But if you're a fat person who loses weight because of your eating disorder, then you're a success story, right? Congratulations and we are so proud of you. And the way that these people are treated also often has an impact on their ability to seek and be provided with the appropriate care that they deserve, right? We already talked about the diagnosis issue. It is entirely common for folks in larger bodies to be uh, excluded from the diagnosis that they actually should be getting. Um, it's common for folks to be diagnosed with atypical anorexia or eating disorder not otherwise specified is another common one that also doesn't get taken seriously for uh, what it's worth. Uh, but this can also have an impact on the timeline of folks being uh, actually provided with the care that they are seeking and the care that they deserve. It's some what common for folks in larger bodies to experience stigma and discrimination and also a, a feeling of fear and shame that is like a, an internalized belief that we have that my eating disorder must not be that serious because I'm still fat and so therefore I don't deserve care, right? Or therefore these behaviors aren't disordered, right? Even though the truth is that dieting is a disordered eating behavior that can very much turn into a formal eating disorder if we are doing it in a fat body from the outside. First of all, people aren't really gonna clock that as easily as they would in somebody in a smaller body. Body. But on top of that, we can tell ourselves that I deserve this, right? I deserve to be miserable and hungry and sad and to hate myself because shouldn't I? Shouldn't I hate myself? The world tells me that I ought to and that I will never be worthy of love until I reach some far off in the distance uh, mythical goal weight. And so therefore I deserve this. And so these people will oftentimes have a much longer lead up time to being involved with care, which also correlates with having a further complication in your care, right? We talked earlier about how oftentimes the work that we have to do in eating disorder recovery is trauma work first and foremost before we can even have a conversation about the eating disorder specific behaviors um, and having a longer lead up time to being involved with a clinician who can provide you with the right type of care that you deserve means then that this is more time that you are exposing yourself to damaging ideals, that you're internalizing these beliefs about yourself, that you're engaging in disordered behaviors that are harmful to your body and to your brain, um, and that will then complicate your healing and create a longer timeline in regards to how long you have to be involved in therapy, which is also another factor that we have to talk about, which is that eating disorder specific therapy is ungodly fucking expensive. And especially for folks who have developed an eating disorder because of their biological or socioeconomic factors that contributed to a greater feeling of marginalization and stigma, it is really important that we acknowledge that people who need a longer treatment time might not be able to afford that and might not be able to even access that care in the first place. And so it's entirely possible that these people who are very deserving of care and worthy of, of healing might not even be able to access that in the first place and will then end up in in another cyclical pattern where they're, you know, potentially trying to get off of this diet or eating disorder uh, carousel only to be thrust back on because they're not able to successfully complete the course of care that they need. And also that they're being negatively reinforced by their doctors, by their family, by the world around them. And this, you see what I'm saying? Like, I think this really paints a picture about how the world responds so differently to fat people and people in marginalized bodies trying to seek care around this issue of body positivity or having uh, insecurities and fears and traumas about our body than straight size and thin people do. What's also relevant here is that the development and then subsequent heat healing of one eating disorder can actually become uh, the uh, inciting incident for someone to develop uh, an additional eating disorder after healing the first one. Essentially what I'm referring to is this phenomenon where folks who have been in this constant cycle of starvation and then refeeding, 
starvation and refeeding in this cycle. First of all, that these folks have internalized a lot of shame and a lot of stigma about their own body and about their relationship to food and themselves, that this creates a complicating factor, right? And then on top of that, these folks have uh, so effectively been distanced from their hunger and satiety cues and their relationship with food um, that they have a really hard time finding equilibrium after the fact. And this can uh, turn into someone developing binge eating disorder after recovering from a uh, restrictive eating disorder because we're trying desperately to find <laughs> Um, a sense of normalcy or equilibrium with our diet and food intake, um, but we have no frame of reference, especially for folks who have developed eating disorders early in life as teenagers or adolescents. They have no adult experience with a fully developed frontal lobe about how to navigate the relationship with food or their bodies effectively. And this again, creates the cyclical thing where we can be uh, locked in the cycle of trying to heal one thing while it's simultaneously worsening, worsening another thing. And as we've already established, the barrier to um, entry in regards to receiving eating disorder care is significant in the first place, let alone for a second go round. And this is just another thing that's really important for us to acknowledge about the barriers for especially fat folks in regards to healing themselves and their relationships with food and their body and all of the things within that. I also wanna point out here um, that the pull that we experience, this draw that we experience towards food and to eat when we are surviving um, or recovering rather from a very restrictive eating disorder is a primal and gut instinct, right? There's a lot of language and rhetoric about how folks who are recovering from, especially like people when they're done with a diet or they get off of a fad diet, um, that they're binging and that they're disgusting and that they're overindulging, that they're, uh, you know, hedonistic or I forgot what the other word is, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> that there's a lot of shame and judgment assigned to this behavior. And I want to point out that what's happening in this moment is not somebody being a glutton, that's the word I was looking for, um, but rather somebody's primal biological response to being deprived of uh, their sustenance, their very essence by which they survive, that your nervous system is overriding that central uh, or that frontal lobe because of this desperation and this fear, uh, this like deep rooted biological and genetic fear about dying, right? So when we talk about people, especially developing binge eating disorder after having recovered from a restrictive eating disorder or anyways, uh, discontinuing um, restrictive eating disorder behaviors, this is an important thing for us to acknowledge because again, at the root of this behavior is not hedonism or gluttony, it's a desire to live. It's your nervous system saying, please God, stay alive. And I think if we as a culture recognize that and normalize that, we would have a really fucking different attitude about people working through this difficulty with honoring their hunger and satiety cues after discontinuing restrictive behaviors and yet we don't, right? On top of that, the truth is that the eating disorder, weight cycling uh, cycle, all of this stuff is also correlated with obviously feelings of shame and uh, disliking our bodies and ourselves generally. And that's correlated with a decrease in self-care and health-promoting behaviors. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but I want to uh, bring that up in regards to this specifically as it's relevant to like our psychological health and self-care. Because when I say self-care, I don't mean like uh, cucumbers on the eyes, like sort of manicure <laughs> self-care day. Um, what I mean is like the, um, at the core, this behavior being rooted in a love and, and desire to care for your physical, mental, and psychological self. We know that folks who have struggled with the shaming and stigmatizing attitude attitudes and uh, beliefs towards themselves because society told them that they should feel this way, oftentimes they're gonna have a much, much more difficult time in developing self-care behaviors, which then correlates, surprise, with poor outcomes over the long term, especially in regards to our mental health. So this is again an area, we talked about this in regards to our physical health, but we know this phenomenon to be true also in regards to mental health. And it's really important to acknowledge that these things don't happen in a vacuum, right? Your physical health and your difficulty with engaging in health promoting behaviors physically is not the only thing that's going to affect you. When you are a person who has been stigmatized and shamed and judged and discriminated against and been um, treated with violence um, about your body and because you just dare to exist, you are not only contending with the physical impact of that in regards to not being uh, able or not feeling safe to promote your physical health, you're also feeling a deep feeling of shame and judgment about trying to prioritize your mental and psychological health also. And so what we see when people are being marginalized, again, especially with intersecting marginalized identities, is a complete and total breakdown of this person's ability to effectively care for and advocate for and show up for themselves, which I think it goes without saying, does a fucking number on your ability to show up for yourself, to be present in your relationships, to be um, a healthy and 
safe person overall. The other thing that I wanna bring up here in regards to the self-care issue is that this does hold true for people regardless of their body size. We can see in the research clearly demonstrated uh, that body dissatisfaction regardless of your body size is associated with poorer health outcomes and health behaviors, especially because like we talked about earlier, even the, the looming fear of potentially one day becoming a fat is enough to create psychological distress for people and also to create shame and judgment for people. This is at the center of the issue in, in regards to body dysmorphia, right? That we can perceive ourselves to be a person who is unworthy and not deserving of love or care or belonging, even if our body is by and large being uh, accepted or societally approved of. And so this also correlates with a lack of ability to provide ourselves with even basic amounts of self-care or self-validation. And again, I don't think it's surprising to anybody that this is correlated with poor health outcomes overall. Ultimately, the, the point that I wanna make here is that again, in the same way that like, wouldn't it make sense um, that we can just or should just accept people's body size and not have that be a factor in this equation when we talk about how to promote health outcomes over the long-term picture over their life, this is another area that like, wouldn't it just make sense that we could leave people the fuck alone in regards to their body size and in instead focus our energy specifically as clinicians and people in the mental health sphere about encouraging a love and a care and uh, satisfaction with ourselves because we know from the research that this is correlated uh, with a better time and easier time being more likely to engage in things that promote better overall mental health throughout the long term of somebody's life. So I think at this point, a lot of people probably have the question like, okay, so why do we do this then, right? Like we have a mountain of research to support the idea that not only is fatness uh, not the health boogeyman that we've made it out to be, but also that there is a whole mountain of research to support the idea that leaving weight off of the table in regards to our interventions and the, the focus of our behavior in regards to health and well-being um, is probably the best case scenario. So why do we do this then, right? Like why are we as a society, as a culture, as a collective, so fucking fixated on the idea of caring about people's body weight and especially about people losing weight in particular, right? The unfortunate truth here is that it has a lot to do with capitalism and oppression and also power. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Okay. Okay, hi, hello. We took another break because I was uh, a little tired, but we are back and I wanna talk to you about the power and inequity and also capitalism that influences why we as a culture are so fucking addicted and obsessed uh, with uh, prioritizing and prescribing weight loss. So first and foremost in this conversation, I think we really need to address that the people who possess the power and privilege in this equation will surrender it when we rip it from their cold dead hands. And so that's like a big motivator <laughs> um, for like why, or I guess like contributing factor anyways, for why why this is as big of a problem as it is, but it also has a lot to do with capitalism and with money. So I think that's a wonderful segue for us to talk about the phenomenon of obesity being labeled as a disease. So first and foremost, we need to address the fact that obesity being labeled as a disease is controversial in and of itself because obesity doesn't really meet the criteria for being a disease in like the traditional sense. To be clear, in the United States specifically, obesity has been classified as a disease, which was a very controversial and contentious issue. I don't know to to what degree, I know the UK, I think, and like other parts of Europe, it's also labeled as a disease. However, obesity being labeled as a disease is controversial because it is a symptom in, in all or most accounts anyways. Something being labeled a disease oftentimes means that it is a medical condition which has other signs and symptoms and complications associated with it. Obesity doesn't meet that uh, category, right? Or that definition rather, because obesity is a symptom. Obesity, even uh, abiding by the medical norm that obesity um, causes other things. Um, it's a contributing factor for those things. It's not a surefire cause, right? There, again, there is for sure no fucking definitive <laughs> research to prove a causal link in the sense that like having obesity means that you will inevitably develop type two diabetes, for example. Even in the research that has been conducted that does view obesity as a disease, it is most often categorized as um, a demographic feature that will increase your risk of developing those things. But there is no surefire on-ramp link there. It's not as though A plus uh, B equals C, that's not how it works. And so obesity being labeled as a disease just really does not make sense. And so again, you might be asking yourself, why then is obesity labeled as a disease um, if it's not one, right? 
The answer is money. The truth is that if obesity gets labeled as a disease, all subsequent attempts at weight loss can be then billed through insurance. So this means that health insurance companies, as we've, as we've already addressed, right? Like with the metropolitan uh, insurance, life insurance company tables, life insurance companies, health insurance companies are uh, particularly interested in ways that they can, first of all, exclude people from their policies that might potentially cause them to have to actually pay out on the benefits that people pay for, um, but also about how to charge people more money based on their pre-existing condition, conditions and other risk factors, right? So obesity being labeled as a disease means that any attempt for somebody to lose weight can be billed through insurance, which means then that things like weight loss drugs, weight loss surgery, weight watchers, nutrition counseling, exercise counseling or coaching, diet programs, all of that can be billed through health insurance, which is a way that all of these companies can continue to make money off of our backs, right? Um, we talked before about how the uh, International Obesity Task Force pushed the NIH to reclassify the BMI categories and a lot of that motivation coming from their primary shareholders being in bed with pharmaceutical companies and Weight Watchers International. This is another example of this, right? If you can bill Weight Watchers, for example, through your health insurance, then we're both winning, right? The health insurance company and Weight Watchers are making money off of this classification that while it doesn't really make any sense, it's not really founded in what we know to be conventional medical or scientific knowledge, it makes them money. And so therefore we're gonna push for that classification to be instituted, but also to remain there, which is a great segue for us to talk about diet culture, weight loss culture, wellness culture, and all of the things uh, contained within. Diet culture and the like weight loss industry is a $72.6 billion industry at this point. And it's also founded on stealing our self-esteem so that they can sell it back to us, right? Um, this has given way to products like fad diets, juice cleanses, uh, Whole30, paleo, keto, all of those things, right? Intermittent fasting. It's not a... Fuck intermittent fasting for real, but also supplements like appetite suppressants, weight loss uh, supplements and things like that, um, oils, tinctures, all of those things, weight loss apps, fuck you, my fitness pal, specific and uh, intentional fuck you to Noom, stupid ass fucking body wraps, like all of the it work stuff, right? Weight loss teas, lollipops, anti-bloating drinks, bloom, eat my ass, shapewear, waist trainers, fucking cool sculpting, all of these things are <laughs> related to uh, the diet industry, the weight loss industry, and they all are founded on this central belief that fatness, uh, weight gain uh, is a mortal sin that should be avoided at all costs. And if you should find yourself so unfortunate to have been, uh, you know, one of the unmentionables, don't worry, we will sell you a prohibitively expensive product for the low, low price of a monthly subscription that you can never get off of and will also probably, honestly, just make you shit your pants a bunch. I wanna take this opportunity to pause really quick and also address that I don't give a fuck uh, if your diet or weight loss or lifestyle change um, has a flavor that is ever so slightly different than the Atkins diet or Weight Watchers or um, Slim Fast or Jenny Craig or, um, you know, the South Beach diet, whatever the fuck. Just because wellness culture does not look like the diet culture uh, of years past does not mean that it's any less insidious. It does not mean that it's any less dangerous. And it certainly doesn't make it any healthier for you. We... I've talked about this on the channel before, but I just want to be clear and upfront that the wellness industry, especially like the uh, Gwyneth Paltrow flavor of the wellness industry is simply diet culture rebranded, right? We have slapped a, uh, you know, like <laughs> cute headband and um, herbal tincture on the front of it and called it something new. And the truth is that it's all the same, right? There is no normal or appropriate or healthy time in anyone's life when you should be consuming nothing but juice for any length of time. That's disordered, that's fucking unhealthy, and also it doesn't do anything, right? This idea that we are doing cleanses or you know kidney flushes and all of those things, that's not real, right? If you have a functioning kidney and liver in your body, your body's cleansing itself already. That's its literal purpose. Those, that's the purpose of those organs. And if you have no um, further medical complications with those organs that you're aware of, it's likely that your body is doing a fantastically efficient job at cleansing anything out of your body. And also anyone who tries to sell you anything related to flushing toxins or flushing chemicals out of your body is a liar and a charlatan and not even a creative one at that. The idea that chemicals are bad for you is simply fear-mongering. The truth is that everything in our lives is made up of chemicals. For example, table salt is sodium and chloride that has been chemically fused together. They're both 
chemicals, but it's a relatively benign substance and the worst thing that you can do with salt is to over season your food, right? The idea that we need to be flushing toxins or chemicals out of our body is purely an invention, especially of this particular breed of Gwyneth Paltrowism, you know, white straight female wellness culture that sells us this idea that your life's purpose and self-esteem can be found in an aisle at Whole Foods and that's simply not true. The truth is that our uh, self-esteem and sense of belonging and, and well-being is something that we find within, first of all, but also that these products create a cyclical need wherein you buy the product, it provides you maybe a short-term benefit, if not a placebo effect for some amount of time, and then it keeps you reliant on either buying the product again, buying a, a higher intensity of the product, buying the product at a greater frequency, or their um, therefore creating a need for another product, right? I wanna be people, wanna encourage people to be very wary of this idea that wellness culture is totally fine and it's about like prioritizing our well-being and like self-care, like no, it's not. No, it's not. It's diet culture rebranded. It is the same thing. The hard truth is that if your lifestyle change requires you to not eat certain foods, not eat foods at a certain time, you're not allowed to engage in particular behaviors or food groups, if there is any type of restriction that's being involved um, in your lifestyle change, your wellness culture, your cleanse, your refresh, then it's a diet. It's a diet and it's disordered and it's likely going to result in some negative consequences for you and will also provide you with minimal benefit. The truth, especially in the research, what we can see reflected in the academic perspective about dieting, the medical perspective about dieting, when we look at the cold hard facts is that the potential benefits of dieting simply do not outweigh the numerous and well-documented risks that dieting and disordered eating, generally speaking, provides most of its participants. So. I think at this point, a lot of people's question then is like, what the fuck are we supposed to do about this, right? Um, I do want to acknowledge that up to this point, the video has been a little bit doom and gloomy. However, this is the point in, in the video where we're gonna talk more about self-empowerment and like what we as a culture, as a collective can do, first of all, to uh, wrench our self-esteem back from the people who have tried to steal it from us, uh, but also to actually engage in health-promoting behaviors, right? I want to be clear that first of all, again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not anybody's doctor, and even if I were, I'm not your doctor, and so this is not medical advice. Um, so I'm not telling anybody definitively, these are the things that you should be doing in order to be healthy. But what I am telling you is that it's entirely possible to incorporate a variety of health promoting behaviors, both physical, mental, and otherwise into our lives that have nothing to do with weight loss, with body size, with weight stigma that can ultimately uh, lead to a positive outcome in like, our sense of life satisfaction, but also our health, our picture of health generally. So I know that this is a relatively niche audience, um, but for what it's worth as therapists, taking a weight neutral approach is gonna be a really important and obviously key part of our work in interacting directly with clients, especially because uh, we can lower the rates and incidence of eating disorders and the development of disordered eating by providing our clients with a uh, good faith based, uh, good faith, uh, psychoeducation um, in evidence-based practice and also in providing people with pushback around these ideas that weight loss is an inherently healthy thing to do or that uh, health is something that can only be promoted through the vehicle of weight loss. In the CEU that I took, again, shout out to Nancy Ellis Ordway because she's a fucking genius. But uh, one of the things that she talked about in regards to our ethical obligation as clinicians is that if we, for example, had a client present to us with a desire to change their sexuality because they were experiencing experiencing marginalization because of being, because they were immersed in a homophobic environment, for example, we as clinicians would not entertain this request, right? There's no world where a clinician is going to make, well, an ethical clinician should make the choice to say, excellent, I will write you a referral for conversion therapy because that's not helpful. It's contraindicated in the research and we know definitively that that is unsafe for our clients. And so that is not a request that we would endorse or entertain, but rather the conversation would be, okay, like I'm hearing that you want to change your sexuality because you're feeling uh, like you don't belong, because you're feeling shame about it, because you've been told that there is something wrong with you. And so maybe our work should center around that topic. What can we do to talk through that, to interrogate that belief process, et cetera, et cetera. You get it, right? The point that I'm making here is that when clients present to therapy with a desire to lose weight, or especially with this belief that they'll only find their uh, sense of belonging or self esteem at the end of this weight loss rainbow, the question needs to be, 
Why is that, right? Where did you learn that? One of my favorite questions to ask my clients all the time is who taught you that? To the point that my clients sort of roll their eyes at me because they know that it's coming. Uh, but I think it's an important and useful question, especially in regards to this issue, um, because ascertaining at what point did you learn that you were supposed to feel ashamed of your body, right? Who taught you that you are required to hate yourself in order to be a moral and worthy person, right? Where did you learn that? I tell my clients all the time, you didn't shoot out of the womb believing this about yourself. The human condition is such that we want to feel a sense of kindness and compassion towards ourselves. And at some point, somebody robbed you of that, right? Somebody stole that from you. And so who was that? Where did you learn that? And what can we do now to provide that tiny person with the compassion and the love and the belonging that they deserved then, but ultimately you're in a position to provide yourself now? Um, when I know, again, this is sort of a niche audience, but for what it's worth, uh, when we talk about clinicians behaving ethically in this area, I think it's also important that we be leaving our bias at the door in regards to people's medical health, right? Because again, the truth is that health is not a moral flex. And so even if you're not a clinician who's able to get on board with the idea that fatness is at least, uh, or at the very least, a neutral um, factor in regards to somebody's physical health, then at the very least, the kind and compassionate thing that you can do is either A, refer them out to a clinician who is able to do that work with them, or B, accept that health is not a thing that everyone will attain and it's also not necessary um, in regards to discussing somebody's mental or psychological health, right? We should not be telling our clients that you are not worthy of psychological or mental healing unless you are a physically healthy person first. A, because it's ableist as fuck, but B, because that's not our, that's not our work, right? That's not your lane. And so it's important for us to also recognize that bias in ourselves and be willing to leave that at the door. For those of you who are uh, just regular, regular people um, that are struggling with uh, body insecurities, fears, traumas, weight stigma related things, first and foremost, I want to be clear, obviously all of the content in this video is meant to be broad strokes, education and learning. You get it. And also if you want to or need a greater level of care, there are always links in my description for you to find a therapist of your very own. And on top of that, I want to encourage people to remember that you are allowed to ask the question of your therapist like hi hey here's the deal looking for you know therapy around my body image or in eating disorder recovery or in working on you know feeling worthy in my body now what's your stance on fat liberation where do you fall uh in regards to the conversation about weight stigma um what education have you specifically received about the ethics around weight stigma and and being a clinician don't be afraid to ask these questions because first of all any clinician who has actually done the learning will be first of all probably excited to talk with you about it um but second of all happy to provide you with information about the extent of their learning and their education and any therapist who hasn't done that but recognizes that this is an important thing to do should be able to say, actually, I don't know. Let me look into it. This is something that I can look into. It's not something maybe that I've received formal education around, but I'm happy to do that work if you want to embark upon that journey together. Alternatively, if a therapist provides you with pushback with the the, the sort of weird weight uh, stigma e attitude, then we've dodged a bullet and it's really important for you to know that up front before you provided this person with any of your fucking money. And again, I wanna be clear, any therapist that's worth their weight in salt will get on the phone with you or a video call with you or at the very least exchange a few fucking emails with you um, to do a um, consultation to assess, uh, you know, for, for fit and um, like a, a goodness of fit or whatever. Any therapist who is, again, Again, ethical and effective and a good therapist is willing to do that for you or with you. And if they're not, then also, again, we've dodged a bullet in that regard. On top of that, also know that you are always allowed to decline being weighed at the doctor's office and things like that. Realistically, the only time that a doctor absolutely needs to know your weight is if you're going under anesthesia or if there is a very specific medication that is critical for them to know your weight. Other than that, generally speaking, it's not particularly relevant or necessary. And you are always welcome to let your doctor's office know. I I'm declining to be weighed. I really don't want to get on the scale. Please don't weigh me. If your doctor's office refuses to abide by that, you can also ask that they not announce the number out loud or that you can be weighed facing backwards so that you don't have to look at the numbers. There is a whole world of interventions that we can incorporate um, to allow people to avoid what is actually very trigma trigmatizing, <laughs> what is actually very triggering and traumatizing uh, piece of stimuli. In regards to like actual specific or useful advice that I can give you in this area, um, I do want to encourage folks to, to remember first and foremost that this is not a problem of your creation, right? It is very normal to struggle with this issue and I think it would be insane not to. It's very normal and okay to have bad days, to have a difficult time, to have periods of time even where we're like, struggling with body image, with weight stigma, uh, especially for folks who are living in fat or black or brown or marginalized bodies, it makes sense that people would sometimes struggle with the weight of the stigma and judgment that the world leverages at them. 
And that ultimately for a lot of people, first of all, um, having community around this issue can be one of the most impactful ways that we can continue to receive and feel supported in this journey. This is why one of the things that I encourage a lot of my clients to do when we embark upon the uh, body positivity uh, eating disorder journey is to make an intentional effort to incorporate media in your life that feels representative of you. You would be surprised. It seems like a small thing, but you would be surprised what a difference it makes to see your social media feeds filled with people who look like you and are thriving, people who are happy, people who see themselves as beautiful, worthy, sexy, wonderful, happy, thriving, uh, worthy people. And so making that intentional effort to incorporate that in your life can really go a long way um, in helping to feel normal and to feel like you're allowed and also to feel like you're not an anomaly, right? A lot of the messaging that the weight stigma world leverages at us is that we are abnormal, that there are not a lot of people like us and that we should strive to be like all of the rest of the thinnies. Um, and the truth is that that's not really the case, right? There is a whole thriving, wonderful world of fat and plus size people, again, who are living their best lives, who are feeling empowered, who are choosing to not abide by this social and societal stigma. And again, having community around that can really go a long way. I would also encourage people, uh, if you're wanting to make some changes, adjustments, what have you, uh, in regards to your opinion about your body or your beliefs about your body, um, to look into the fundamental differences between body positivity and body neutrality. It's a somewhat contentious issue. I know that people have strong opinions about it. Personally, I don't know that it, it really like it bothers me one way or the other. Body positivity is the hope that at some point we can have unconditional positive regard uh, towards our body and about our bodies. Oftentimes this is guided by a desire of wanting to see our bodies as worthy, as beautiful, as positive, right? Whereas body neutrality is more so the approach that my body is a meat suit that ultimately means nothing, right? Um, that my body is simply the vehicle through which I experience life. And so therefore I need not assign any moral value to it because it is just that, nothing more than a vehicle. People will land in different places with whether they resonate with one more than the other. And I think resonating with either of these is perfectly morally neutral for what it's worth, but knowing which camp you fall into um, tends to be helpful in regards to seeking out affirmations, interventions, care. Also, if you're looking for formal care, um, finding a clinician or a professional who aligns with the thing that you feel most closely drawn to will make a world of a difference in terms of getting traction and getting your feet under you to feel uh, like we're believing in here what we try to believe up here. The last piece of advice that I wanna give you is to practice challenging the preconceived notions and the stigma that we have about our bodies and about the world around us. There are very much real and practical limitations to existing in a larger body and it is entirely possible to also challenge some of those norms and conventions. For example, uh, wear the crop top, right? Go and wear the, the bodycon or um, you know closely fitting dress. Go start a new hobby or start a new sport, almost in an opposite action kind of way. For those of you who are not familiar, opposite, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> almost in an opposite action kind of way um, to whatever degree you feel safe and comfortable. Practice engaging in these things that the world has told you that you shouldn't be allowed to do, that you're not allowed to do, or that nobody else else will think is normal if you do. Again, this can look like wearing the clothes that you want to wear, choosing to see yourself in the mirror, seeking out representation of people who look like you, who are happy, thriving, sexy, uh, you know, empowered. But it can also look like doing the things that you want to do and just doing them fat, right? A lot of us tell ourselves that we can do the things that we feel called to or like our life's goals once we have met a certain uh, weight goal or once we finally fit into a certain pant size. And the truth is that you can do all of the things that you want to do and just do them fat. If you are a person who wants to go on roller coaster vacations more, um, there are fat positive and more friendly or plus size friendly parks that you can go to to ride roller coasters, right? If you want to travel more, it might be uncomfortable and uh, an emotionally challenging experience to get on the airplane, to pack the luggage and to do the things, but you can do the things, right? Challenging the stigma around weight and body size sometimes looks like choosing to say no. I'm not allowing you to steal my life from me because I want to go sit on a topless beach at the age of 27 and not when I'm, I don't know, 65 in this idea that I will one day achieve a perfect body weight and body size and then I'll be worthy of doing the thing that I want to do. If you want to do it, you can do it now. You can do it fat. And again, I don't want to uh, devalue or pretend that there aren't going to be logistical and societal barriers that may present themselves to you. And you can overcome those, you can push back on those, and especially in seeking community around this issue, it is entirely possible to live the life that you wanna live that feels empowering to you 
It makes you feel fucking good about yourself and just doing it while you're fat instead. For what it's worth, for those of you who are like me um, and find it most helpful to weaponize your sense of self-righteous indignation and uh, if you told me that I'm not allowed to, then I'm gonna fucking definitely do it now. Um, remember that choosing to love your body and find joy in your body in and of itself is an act of rebellion, right? Um, we talk about capitalism a lot on this channel um, and this is a similar take that we've had about capitalism in terms of taking our time and choosing to take our joy back, right? We can't necessarily do anything as individuals to overthrow the system um, that seeks to oppress us or steal our joy, but one thing that we can do is choose to take our joy back in the meantime, right? Uh, we as individuals might not be able to single-handedly change the medical perspectives, uh, our medical industry's perspective about fatness or body sizes or weight stigma, but you can certainly choose to add advocate for yourself and choose to say, I don't give a fuck what you think about my body or about what I'm worthy of because I know that I'm worthy and I'm going to do the things that I want to do and I'm going to do them now. Along with that, please remember that finding joy in caring for and providing for your body is something that we can do regardless of your perspective in, in terms of body neutrality or body positivity, right? Because regardless of whether you believe that your body is inherently good and you are worthy because of your body or whether you believe that your body is uh, ultimately just a meat suit, the truth is also that your body is a marvel of evolutionary genius. It's a collection of stardust that is uniquely you. Um, it's also the vehicle by which we are able to receive and show love to other people. It's the vehicle that allows us to feel how good it's, it feels to sit in the sun on a nice day um, and how wonderful it is to taste like chocolate and peanut butter, for example, right? Our body provides us with lots of wonderful services and it is so worthy of, worthy of love and belonging and care and compassion and all also, if you are a person who is struggling with body image issues, with weight stigma stuff, please know that if nobody has ever told you, I am so sorry that somebody ever told you that your body was not worthy because it is. It always was and it always will be and you deserve to find love and comp Ew, I can't cry on camera. Again, not me reparenting myself in a video. It's not funny, but it's kind of funny. <laughs> Shout out to my mom for the body image issues. <sighs> You guys, we did it. We made it to the end of this video. Um, I do want, first of all, if you made it this far, you're a real one and thank you for being here. Um, I love you all the most. Thank you for being along for this ride. Um, I do want to give another shout out to Sabrina Strings and her book, Fearing the Black Body. If you have not read it, please go read it or listen to it. Um, I will link um, in the description where to find all of the references and the books that I read and listened to for this uh, video. Um, also again, shout out to Nancy Ellis Ordway. Um, she has a book called Thrive at Any Weight and her, if you are a clinician, um, a social worker specifically, I guess, her CEU presentation about uh, ethics, social justice, and weight stigma that's on the NASW CE Institute is so good. So if you're a clinician, I highly recommend taking that also. It's also relatively inexpensive if you're an NASW member. So for what it's worth, um, but generally speaking, I hope that if nothing else, you can walk away from this video knowing that first of all, it is not necessary for us to be a healthy person in order to be worthy of love and belonging, but also on top of that, this idea that fatness makes you inherently unhealthy and therefore not worthy of love and compassion is a lie. It sucks, it's not true, and it's not even based in fact or research. Um, and in fact, all of the uh, relevant, robust, good quality research would lead us to believe that it is in fact entirely possible to be a fat and healthy person and regardless of your health status, a person person who is worthy of love and belonging and compassion and care, and also that there are whole systems of oppression and power that are dedicated to trying to steal that power from you. And so sometimes the most compassionate and rebellious and self-loving thing that we can do is to choose to love ourselves anyways. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, obviously like the video. Um, let me know what your thoughts and feelings are in the comments. Um, I know that people will have lots of feelings about this video. Um, so let me know what you're thinking and feeling. I am, again, open to feedback and happy to hear what you guys think about it. Um, but if nothing else, I hope that you guys uh, found the video helpful and or useful. Um, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you wanna help support me. Again, I'm gonna shout out my own Patreon because I won't even lie to you. I put a fucking Herculean amount of effort into this goddamn video. So if you wanna support me, you can subscribe to our Discord or our Patreon, um, which gives you access to the Discord, um, or join our channel memberships. Um, and with that, share the video to help the channel grow and to help each other grow and I'll see you guys for next one. The next one. <laughs> Yay, I did it. I'm so tired. Golf claps for me. Also shout out to Pistachios for fueling this, this video.
I'm done. <laughs> Show's over. Go home. <laughs>